Plus 2 is proud to bring you the 2 Plus 2 Poker Cast, presented by the Poker Stars VIP Club. This week on the Poker Cast, Joe Ingram and Alex Dreyfus. Now here they are, Je suis Charlie et Je suis Charlie, Adam and Terrence. Welcome, everybody, to the 2 Plus 2 Poker Cast presented by the Poker Stars VIP Club. I am your host, A. Schwartz. Uh, joining us again from Bali, Indonesia, is our uh, co host, world traveler, Terrence Chan. Terrence, welcome to the show. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, how's it going? I, I was. I, I got a little karma um, from last week. I was bragging about, you know, yeah. drinking cocktails and having a son, and uh, and I and I came down with uh, what they call locally here is as Bali Belly, which is uh, you know people might know it as you know traveler's diarrhea or food yeah. poisoning or whatever whatever horrible ailment. So I've I've been down for the count uh, for a few days, and uh, but you know just recovered just enough to uh, to help. Bring the show. I couldn't. I couldn't abend the listeners this week. Got a lot of stuff to talk about. So uh, yeah, I'm sucking it up and uh, and uh, putting on and and putting on the headset for this week. You're playing hurt. You're a good Canadian. I'm kid, playing hurt. Right? Yeah, I'm trying. Get I'm your trying stitches. My best. You, you, my get, best. you take a puck to the face. You get stitched up. You get right back out there. Yeah, or in this rub- case, <laughs> you, you sit on the toilet and record the show from that from the toilet. Yeah, just in just in case, like I suddenly stop talking mid sentence, and then the next thing you hear is a, a whooshing of a toilet. Now you now you know what, you know happened. what happened. <laughs> I don't think I want to hear that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think anybody, uh, unless we have some gastroenterologist uh, listening to this program. In in and if there is, please <laughs> shoot me an email. Uh, I could definitely hear from you. <laughs> uh, we got a big show this week. We we talked last week about uh, what we were going to do with guests going forward. Um, um, and then we turned around and, uh, well, I did, booked a couple of guests uh, mm-hmm. to, uh, to to talk to everybody today. This It's going to be Joe Ingram, uh, who was requested. We, we said we were going to pay attention to the Suggest a Guest thread. We're doing that this week. Uh, Joe Ingram. Joey. Uh, Chicago Joey. Chicago, Chicago Joey. Joey. Yeah. Uh, Joey, one, or Joey Ingram 1, I think he is on Twitter, at Joey Ingram 1. Um, we also have, uh, from the GPI, Alex Dreyfus, who uh, we, we talked last week about one of the things... That is a thing from 2014 that I don't want to be a thing anymore. Uh, I mentioned was award shows. You didn't want it to be a thing, and I wasn't even aware that it was a real thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, some proof was sent your way this week. Uh, uh, yes, in, it was on Twitter. And uh, I thought, why not we bring in? We, and somebody was giving us a hard time about uh, not having dissenting viewpoints on the show. And uh, why not have? I don't know if they're giving us a hard time, but they're saying you should have people who disagree from us because I guess apparently we agree too often. We do, but that's we just because we're right. <laughs> exactly. No, it is not. It you is know, not. it's funny it's actually. We're, we're I never, I, I never really thought about it till you said it just then. But MJ and I used to disagree fairly often on stuff, mm-hmm. and I think that comes from the fact that he is a, in a completely different life than you and I are in. So we, I, I think poker players tend to see things similarly. Uh, guys who are running giant businesses and doing quite well, and kind of are <laughs> on the periphery of. Of of the poker world might see things a little differently, and uh, so you're you're saying the difference is that you and I are a couple of DJs, whereas Mike and somebody like Alex Jeffress are actually successful in the real they, world, they and therefore their they're... opinions differ from ours. They see. Yeah, I wonder why that is. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, we're gonna have Alex on. He's gonna try and convince us that uh, uh, award shows and sportifying poker is a good thing. I think he's probably uh, got an uphill battle there, but who knows? Well. And right. uh, we've, uh, we're, we're going to touch on some of that. We're going to get to that later. Um, Terrence, uh, I wanted to ask you, this week you uh, are doing some work for DraftKings. I'm not sure if we mentioned it on the show. I think we did quickly. Um, doing some MMA consulting for them. DraftKings, of course, the daily fantasy sports site uh, that has recently introduced MMA. And uh, you, were, you were the guy in point for that. Yeah, uh, wasn't really on point. I mean, I've, I've just been working with them, as you mentioned, um, a lot, doing a lot of content at this point. Basically, they've obviously got a ton of daily fantasy sports knowledge. I don't have a lot because I'm not really a fantasy sports guy at all, but they didn't have uh, too many 
MMA sharps on their on the roster, so they need somebody with some help and you know kind of guide them in the right direction. So I was like, ah, that that'd be fun. That's a nice uh, little entry point, a few few hours to fill each week. So yeah, I was I, was, I did some of their content pieces. I wrote a strategy piece, the first strategy piece uh, for DraftKings ever on MMA. Uh, their first uh, the you know preview UFC 182 was this last weekend. So I did a preview of of the rosters that you could uh, possibly select. You know, it's the same format as all. If you're familiar with fantasy sports, you know it's um, you know, each guy has a different salary and the guys who are expected to score more points, they obviously cost more. So you've got to balance your salary. So I kind of went through and said who I thought was a good pick and, and not so good a pick. And uh, but but the cool thing is I got to play and I and I smashed this week. I entered a ton of contests, uh, as many as I could, because I was just so excited about real money this going on. Real money contests. You, you got involved. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, you set you know, the line and also <laughs> and also bet on the line. I well, I mean, I was I helped involved. No, I mean, I you make it sound so shady. No, <laughs> but no, obviously, uh, yeah. you know, obviously they asked me, you know, is are these are these appropriate? And, yeah. and you know, I'm I'm going to give my honest opinion on that. But yeah, I was, uh, you know, I I put in a bunch of teams in there, but uh, my teams foc- focused. Or I don't, I, like I said, I don't really know anything about daily fantasy strategy. I just, you know, so but I know in these big tournaments, you got to kind of do something to differentiate yourself uh, from the field. So, you know, I, I kind of had a couple guys that I was pretty confident were underdog picks and good low salary picks and then built a bunch of, you know, permutations around that and um, ended up, you know, ended up having a, a few of my teams did really well and I entered like a zillion contests. Uh, so I, I did really well on that. So that was kind of fun. Um, so they, they let the fish win in the first week is what happened. They, they did let the fish win. Actually, it was really funny. I, I, there's this journalist on, on Twitter uh, named Adam, Adam Martin, and he's just an MMA uh, journalist. And, and they're not dissimilar from poker journalists. They don't make a lot of money. And uh, he finished second for 6K. And, you know, he was tweeting a storm about how this is life-changing money for him. <laughs> I, oh, my God, I can't believe this has happened. Thank you guys so much for your support. Oh, uh, it, you know, yeah, it, it was really cool to see. I mean. And, you know, and, it, and it's just funny, like the other end of the spectrum. It's like, yeah, all right, I, I did okay, I guess. Like, you know, I'm up like seven grand for the day. Like, yeah, yeah. good <laughs> um, hit. But yeah, good, good hit. So yeah, he was he was super stoked about that. So, but anyway, MMA. Um, you know, a lot of people think that this could be the next big thing in fantasy, obviously, because. Uh, you know, for, for a couple of reasons, there's no MMA season, right? So you've sure. got you've got it almost every week of the year, and uh, you know it's not weather dependent. It's a it's an indoor sport. It's not seasonal at all. It's growing, and it is also um, it's it's got a little more international reach than than many other sports. You know, like NFL football or Major League Baseball or or you know, you know other sports like like uh, the NBA is a little bit more international, and soccer is obviously super, the most international sport. But but there's a there's a little bit of international appeal of people punching each other in the face that that sort of is maybe a little you know culturally transcendent so that was kind of fun people punching each other in the face yeah that well you know like <laughs> you know I've, hell? I've is ross even this? listening to the show anymore <laughs> <laughs> he's just like <laughs> you know i wasn't paying attention <laughs> <laughs> hit him in the face yeah but um yeah. Oh. He's totally lost my train of thought. But, Sorry. Um, yeah, I, you, I wanted to get to one thing you said, and it's interesting that sure. I noticed this week. You mentioned you entered. How many contests do you think you entered? How many uh, entries do you know. think, think you had? O- over 60. But I was also trying out the different formats, too, because, like I said, I'm such a, a fantasy sports noob that I was trying, like, the big prize pools, obviously, um, and, like, the big, uh, you know, the MTT-style ones where hundreds of people enter, as well as they've got 50-50s where you only have to finish in the top half of the pool, sure. and then you've got the small leagues. And I, so I was, I, was, I was just shotgunning rosters because I was basically just trying to learn what's going on. Um, and so gambling, I think I up, learning by, yes. <laughs> by gambling up a storm. I love it, and I, I noticed some some people would call it that. Yeah. I call it research. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, I noticed uh, somebody, they, you know, the big. I don't know if you've ever uh, entered one. I don't think you have, but the NFL ones, the million, the uh, weekend million dollar ones on Sundays for NFL. Um, somebody entered eleven hundred teams. I saw on Twitter. I think uh, Brian I Hastings that, yeah. or somebody was tweeting about it. Uh, I, I, you I have think, to do that, man. Can, are you doing that with a script? Like, I mean, I, I entered these you teams, have to and be, yeah. you know, I. How do you? You have to use a script, right? Like, yeah. it's not possible not to, right? No, no, okay. that's absolutely have to use a okay. script doing that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but that's just nuts. I. Uh, I, I noticed that on Twitter, people were talking. Do those about things it. still have like a big overlay? Because that's why most people are entering them, right? 
Uh, they do. Well, I mean, overlay. No, they don't have an overlay. But I think. Uh, oh, they don't. The, it's the it's the whole skill thing um, that people are talking about. That you know the skill differentiation of people. But, you know, they, but don't you? If you have eleven hundred entries, aren't you at some point watering down your average quality? Well, of that's like you can't. That's the interesting part. And I, I've uh, next time we have somebody on, or, or even you, if you want to talk about this, is um, this approach to daily fantasy sports and how different it is. You know, um, the diminishing returns of each extra entry that you put in a contest uh, you know I, I don't know I, I i don't know i'm not smart enough to understand how that works um yeah. but but there has to be some sort of uh, uh you know ceiling to how many teams it's profitable right we need a we need a dfs expert on it because like the only way i can see it is if there's some overlay that they're not going to make in which case it's it's the same as you know when you enter the lottery uh you're just buying as many tickets as possible because it's it's actually plus ev even if you you don't really know what you're doing so yeah. if there's an overlay i can understand putting 1100 teams in but at some point i have to think like some of these teams can't be very good <laughs> <laughs> no it can't be um but anyway interesting i i wanted to get your take on uh, on the mma uh, uh daily fantasy sports at draft Kings and, and if you want yeah. to enter that, no, that check that out um cool. so you're gonna be working with them for a while are you um yeah you know just on a on a consulting basis doing doing some stuff uh mostly providing content with for them really uh just to be able to um you know do some previews do some do some stuff uh we're gonna we're gonna work on more various content things throughout like uh, if you've ever been to uh you know, DraftKings. You know, you know that they do a lot of video content. They do a lot of written content. That seems to be one of the keys to their to their strategy with uh, differentiating themselves between you know the fan duels and and their other competitors in that space. Is that they want to to do a lot of content. So they they want me to do some of that. But I'm also lazy. So we'll see how much I actually do. <laughs> yeah, you're retired. You don't need another job. You got you got this job. Can't be I, I do. This the, is, and this is a content job too. It is. It is. <laughs> Uh, this week's adventure in parenting, I know people, some people have mentioned and, and messaged and said that they get a kick out of some of the stories, but I wanted to quickly just expl- tell this one this week. Uh, I dropped my uh, kid off, my son, at uh, my buddy's house. He wanted to go on a sleepover at uh, my friend who has a son the same age, and they watched movies all night. And I went back and I got him the next morning, and the first thing he says to me, and he's nine, he says, uh, Dad, what's the Catalina wine mixer? <laughs> <laughs> And I, I just laughed because my buddy Norm's hilarious. He, he got there and he's showing the his, the nine year old's uh, stepbrothers. So I, I got a kick out. Of course, I said it's the biggest helicopter leasing event in the Western Hemisphere since 1997, son. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that was that was pretty amusing. So uh, uh, everybody is in PCA. Uh, everybody's in the Bahamas, yep. Terrence. I yeah. know this time of year, uh, those you've gone many times. I've been a few times myself. Yeah, uh, the Twitter is a bit tilting, but with all the it people is. down it's there, so brutal. It's like, like oh, it's- look at this beach, and I've got a drink in my hand, and look at my room. It's fantastic, and I've got this. And I'm colleague. having so much fun playing this poker tournament, and we're <laughs> and it's uh, you know all the all so the bad that goes on back and forth, a silly prop bet. That stuff's always happening. It's always fun because whenever it's time to book the PC, I'll, I'll put it bluntly, the, the Bahamas, the Atlantis is not my favorite destination to travel That's not to. blunt. Okay. That's politically I, I hate, correct. I, I, hate, I hate the place. Okay, fine. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. I hate the place. How's that? Um, because, you know, for all the reasons, you know, for those who haven't been, it, it, okay, for those who haven't been, you should go once. Um, you, well, here's the very, thing. You're not yeah. the lazy river guy. This is what a lot of people would enjoy. I, I, no, I do love that stuff. I No, I, that's the thing. That's why I... That's why I say you should go once. Yeah. Like, you know, if you, you know, you should definitely go once and, and, you know, float down the lazy river and do the crazy, super scary water slide and, (laughs) you know, go through the shark tank, not literally jump in the shark tank. We've covered that before. Don't actually jump in the shark tank. (laughs) Yeah. You know, go to the dolphin swim, go to the underground, explore, get lost in the maze. You know, it's, it's, it's miles of, of property. It's cool. You should definitely do it once. But once you've been there a number of times, all the stuff kind of starts to tilt you. You know, the customer service is not very good there. They slap like huge service fees and charges on everything. It's like eighteen dollars for a burger, and it's like that's nine not. By the way, that's not truck. an exaggeration. It is actually no, eighteen dollars for a burger. Yeah. 
Like it's you, obscene. <laughs> like yeah. with, with and uh, Elkie posted on my Facebook today. They added, I think he said a seven point five percent value added tax on everything, and that's on top of the service charge they already had on everything. Like it's wow. it's insanely nickel and dimey, and and it's not nickel and dimey. It's it's like you know it's dollar and two dollar yeah. uh, <laughs> They're just always trying to get extra dollars out of you in this brutal, brutal way. But it is a it is a, a hell of an experience, and I because everybody you know is there, other than the World Series, it's it's obviously the most attended uh, poker festival there is, Be, and, and everybody's down there. Whether it's pros, whether it's amateurs, they all love going there. They're all there. You've got huge high stakes tournaments. You know, we've got the hundred k super high roller that I'm sure we'll talk about shortly. Um, it, it, and you do get jealous, kind of reading everybody's Facebook pictures and Twitter pictures and uh, all the stuff that's going on. So so much fun going on there. Now, uh, one guy, uh, uh, Christian Vaughn, he's uh, involved with Aussie Millions, pointed out that since I'm in Bali, you know, I'm only about a five hour flight uh, from there to the Aussie Millions, of course, and he's got a, a vested interest. You're only in, five uh, hour, five hour, five hour flight, really? Yeah, so Bali is like right, um, just barely south of the equator. So it's about halfway between Hong Kong and uh, and you know southern Australia. Not bad, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I could I could get there. So I don't know. You know, for you it would be a bit longer flight, but you want to a do bit. another live show? Just a bit. <laughs> it's uh, a seventeen hour. What flight. can I do to get you on a on a fifteen hour flight and come do the live show? We get we haven't done a live show in like two months. Man. I know, I know. We we always, I mean, I, I'll do it for the listeners. <laughs> Yeah, I know Ross will come. Of course, Ross will come. Ross is already booked. Yeah, Ross, Ross has already had his bag packed. He's he's looking at me, hoping that uh, I'm answering yes to that. I'm sure, <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. I uh, I don't know if I can do it this year. I love Australia, and in fact, if I had to pick between the two, as much as I like beaches and and uh, drinks from blenders. Uh, Australia is is probably where which one I would pick to be honest. It's oh absolutely like it's 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 got this well, it's, the weather's probably hotter if you like hot weather in Melbourne during this time of year than it is in Bahamas. Yeah, um, it's about equally expensive, but uh, but it's got the tennis going on. It's got you know Melbourne's a great city with all the the parks and the cafes and the activities. You know it's a it's a it's a big city. It's a big modern city. Um, but talk, yeah, it doesn't. They, they talk funny over there. They do. They, they talk they a little do. funny. Yeah. Indeed, you, uh, you, you come from. If you spend enough time there, you end up talking like them. It's, that's <laughs> the scary part. Indeed. Uh, all right, let's get to some poker stuff. Uh, in case you missed it this week, this is from a couple weeks ago. We didn't get to it. Uh, let's get to it now. Uh, a partial schedule uh, for the 46th annual World Series of Poker in Las Vegas this summer has been released. Uh, Ross, we will be going to that. So it's your first trip to Vegas. Uh, save up your shekels. But- You're going to need them. Um, a full schedule is going to be announced later in January, but there are some highlights uh, that they released uh, of the upcoming series. The main event is going to start, I think it's almost every year it starts on the same day or, or one day off, uh, right on that July 4th holiday weekend. Uh, this year, right. day one is going to be Sunday, July 5th, uh, three day ones, same as last year. Remember, they used to do four day ones. They've moved away from that. I, I think the last one was sort of that colossal nightmare with everybody trying to sign up on day four. And, well, uh, but now it's just everybody trying to sign up on day three. Like they just uh, they've yeah. decided that three is better than four, and I'm fine with that too because it means that if you decide to play one A, you don't have to hang around and wait for all the other four flights days, to, yeah. to get to play day day through. So I'm fine with I'm I'm happy with that. But yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It's usually around the uh, the Independence Day holiday. Well, just what they do with the three days, it it uh, forces everybody to play one day one and two. I mean, it just draws it out if you make it four days, and you know they're talking about the same I numbers. See. So I I think it just seems natural to go with three days uh november the november 9 will uh be set on the 14th of july i think they said it's uh 10 day 10 this year it, but i remember it being day nine i don't know if they're shortening days but i can't imagine they they, they did do five hour levels or sorry five two hour levels each day i don't know how they're going to shorten that but um 10 million dollars again first price uh, first place guarantee uh, we'll talk more about that. It caused a little bit of controversy. Um, as you would expect, though, the wildly popular Millionaire, millionaire Maker and the Monster Stack events are going to be back. Um, the disappointing $1 million buy-in big one for one drop is not back. Uh, I, and I don't know. It's, it, do you think that's ever going to yeah. be a tournament again, T? Do you think that, that, that big one for one drop million dollar buy-in is going to happen again? Um, I I do suspect it will. Obviously, there are you know there was lots of rumor last year of you know um, a break between the Macau businessmen and and you know and and they didn't they didn't they weren't happy with what was going on. But you know if you look at the the way that 
poker buy-ins trending, you don't really see big buy-in tournaments going downwards. I mean, you're just seeing more and more 100Ks and 250Ks. So a $1 million buy-in, as much as that is, isn't so beyond the pale. So I don't know if I'll see, we'll see it back in 2016. It wasn't scheduled for 2015 anyway. So, you know, the fact that it's not on the schedule this year is, is not a big thing because it also, also wasn't on the schedule in 2013. Um, so, right. you know, that I, I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, so, you know, and, and you know, the, the charity itself is, is still going to be involved in the World Series uh, in the World Series this year. It's going to have the uh, the the hundred eleven thousand buy in and the and the one thousand buy in. So, so the charity is is still uh, clearly involved with the World Series, and and there will be a lot of focus on the hundred eleven k. I'm sure. Yeah, the big one uh, I would say is was somewhat dependent on. Um, those elusive uh, Macau players that uh, did not come over this year or, or did come over and didn't play, uh, for whatever reason, there was talk of uh, a rift between them and Guy. Uh, but uh, that was, it seemed like, was uh, the driving force, having those people play in the tournament so other people would pony up the mill ball. But like you said, I mean, we've got uh, uh, $250,000 tournaments around the world. We've got tons of 100K buy-ins. Uh, on the EPT and, uh, and in North America as well. So it's not like, um, you know, there's a shortage of, of the money out there to go play in these things. And, and you know, it, it, it almost doesn't matter uh, too much uh, if you get 30 or 40 people at the World Series of Poker because you get that final table that's televised and some large amount of money to a winner um, where they can tie it up in a bow and put it on TV and somebody's winning this giant amount of money, right? Whether it's 35 or 46 or whatever, um, they still get to, to make it look like a pretty big deal. Right. Like, let's say, let's say you know, they, they ran it and, and it got a horribly disappointing, you know, 22 players or something like that. Well, they could just make, they could still make it pay two and be like 15 to first and seven to second and still make a big deal out of it. I mean, that would, that would still get tons of media attention. You could still make a TV show out of it. You would still have all the drama that's associated with it, whether it's 20 players, 30 players, 40 players, 50 players. Um, and, and there is probably enough just pure ego in poker to get a 20 player field i i kind of feel that that's way that there's probably 20 guys who could think that they have an edge over the field in a one million buy-in tournament yeah exactly mm-hmm. <laughs> poker's not short of big egos that that's for sure uh the series does kick off with a new event called the colossus and uh it seems like they're running out of synonyms for huge colossus yes. <laughs> i mean pretty soon. air maker and the monster stack monster yeah. everything okay so this one is a uh, 565 and dollar buying it's got a five million dollar guarantee uh the quote from uh, ty stewart is load up the entire gang the home game the spouse whomever you know that enjoys the game the colossus is going to feature a historic prize pool at this buying level and it can only happen at the world series of poker and as soon as I read that, I, uh, I remember about a month ago, we had a $5 million guaranteed $200 buy-in online. So I'm not <laughs> sure uh, if uh, Ty knows that uh, PokerStars runs some pretty big tournaments or not. Oh, I'm pretty sure he, he's aware of that. He might have forgot, that's... yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in the, uh, in the press release, uh, the World Series of Poker stated, the average World Series of Poker gross gold bracelet event in 2014 featured a $3.5 million prize pool with eight, almost 800000 going to the event's winner. Um, that's interesting as well. I mean, I think that's skewed by, uh, obviously, the million-dollar buy-in and some of the bigger events, and to kind of hold that number events, out there yeah. um, and call it uh, the average, you know, and highlight it as an average of 800000 for first is a bit disingenuous yeah. because so many It doesn't matter. It's a, meaning, it's, it's a meaningless stat, yeah. and if you, if you know, it's just, it's, just, uh, it's just one of those, like, bullet points by the numbers thing that's, that's kind of fun, but everybody knows it's meaningless. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe for no limit hold'em tournaments. Yeah, yeah. yeah they it's probably really the limit hold'em tournaments. It's probably just really close to that number, like slightly over it, because mm-hmm. the fact is that almost every first place of a non no limit hold'em event, if not all of them, are are going to be below eight hundred thousand. I think. Yep, for sure. The uh, the two buy in level uh, for the mixed games is back. Remember, we had uh, we went from having a five k and a ten k and twenty five hundred and ten k and some to a fifteen hundred and ten k last year. The I two hate different this. Events. Yeah. Um, interesting. You hate it, do you? Tell me why. Well, because, I mean, it used to be that, I, I know why they're doing it, because it seems more consistent. Oh, if you have a, the, the world championship of every game is a 10K and it looks cool, and then there's the 1500 that's accessible to the average guy. Okay, that's fine in theory. 
fact of the matter is, though, it made a lot more sense before. You had things like uh, the 2500 Raz, right? Because really, how many people are going to pony up 10k to play Raz? You know, there, are, there just aren't that many uh, you know, high-stakes Raz players in the world. I mean, when's the last time you saw a 200-400 Raz game somewhere in a yeah. casino? It just doesn't happen. Right. Right. So, you know, and then you have other games that are still popular, like Limit Hold'em and Limit 08, that do not get to have this tournament at the the twenty five hundred or the three thousand dollar level. That that's sort of that middle price point that would be comfortable for the live, especially mid stakes. I'm thinking particularly of like the mid stakes LA players, a lot of whom. You know, because I've played, I mean, I've probably played 75% of all the, the Limit Hold'em tournaments at the World Series for the last 15 years um, that come up. So all these guys come up from L.A. Uh, or other parts of California and play in, in these tournaments because they don't play No Limit. And yeah, it's their minority of people who don't play No Limit. But these are, these are kind of the events that they're comfortable. They're not going to put up 10K because they're not, you know, the black chip players or, you know, the, the, the 100, 200, 200, 400 level players. But they, they want to play a, a 2K or a 2500 or a 3K or even a 5K, uh, but not willing to play a 10K. So it, to me, it, it's, it's trying to shove a square peg in a round hole a little bit. I mean, you know, Adam, I, I kind of think of, of you as one of these uh, players to some extent. I don't know how comfortable you are. Are playing 10k Omaha eight or better? You know, if you had all of your action, you will play a 1500. But I feel like you'd play some stuff in between, right? I would, uh, but I'm not sure. I, you know, I, what I would counter that discussion there that you just uh, you, you were talking about. I would say that a lot of casual players. Uh, are going to jump in a 1500 who really don't know the game too well because they're going to bracelet hunt. Oh, there's only 200 people in this thing. Uh, I've played uh, Pot Limit Omaha eight or better once. Well, if you're going to bracelet hunt, you should bracelet hunt in a 10k because you're only going to have to beat like a hundred. No, but if they don't have the if they don't have yeah. the bankroll, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about guys who go to the uh, the World Series of Poker with 15,000 and to you know poker players. Okay. They they go with 15,000. Um, maybe they cash and and you know now they have 20, 25, and and a 1500. You know, stud comes up, and well, I've played stud before. Uh, you know, it's in the mix once in a while that I play. Why don't I just go ahead and play it? Um, so, I, I mean, I think I understand what you're saying, and, and there's definitely I agree with uh, with it. And you're going to lose some people, but I think you also pick up um, some casual players. However, those casual players aren't going to go and play a 1500 and a 10k. So uh, it's not like you know you've picked those guys up long term type thing. You know, and they're not going to yeah. turn, turn into you know, playing the big game right away. I just, I just, well, a couple things on that. I guess I don't see the casual player with a 15K World Series bankroll showing up in Vegas. Like, I, I know a lot of these guys, and, you know, they'll show up to Vegas for like 10 or 12 days, and they've, you know, they've got their schedule, and they've highlighted every event that they want to play in advance, and it's it's usually their best games, or at least what they feel is their best games uh, at the appropriate buy-in levels. And so I, you're right that these guys might be more likely to play 1,500. I mean, a lot... I I mean, uh, you know, I've played against guys in 1500 who, who've never played poker before. So, of course, you yeah. know, of course uh, the, this happens. Uh, but it, I, I feel like, like that effect is maybe overstated. And, and secondly, I just don't see a reason to squeeze out the, the middle level uh, uh, player. You know, why, why is the point? Why do you have two limit hold'em tournaments, two limit Omaha 8 or better tournaments, and two Raz tournaments? It doesn't make sense. There are way more 08 and limit hold'em players especially live, then play Raz. I mean, it, it just it doesn't make sense. They're, the, the population of, of Raz players or pure stud eight or better players is just so small uh, compared to, to Limit Hold'em and 08 and, and even to some extent like uh, do seven triple draw. Yeah, no, that's for sure. I, I think that uh, uh, they should be listening to those players that, that you say that, uh, that are going to be the ones poning up and playing in those events. Uh, let's talk about the uh, the ten million dollar guarantee for the main event. So this is uh, the second year we did it last year. Uh, the first prize is a ten million guaranteed, no matter what. Uh, Jack Effel taking some heat, um, and uh, he's not exactly uh, you know one to give give in to to pressure. He can be a little bit stubborn, I would think. Um, he, he he. This is his his uh, take on it. It should be a ten million dollar guaranteed. Um, I, you know, one of the things I think about when this happens is this is the World Series of Poker using the player's money to guarantee, uh, you know, using it to guarantee the, the prize pool. They're not putting up any extra of their money. They're using the prize pool. And if we don't hit that 
uh, you know, enough money. It, what who pays is the players getting a, a shitty payout s- structure. Right. See, the guy who finishes second, third, fourth, fifth, and those sixth. guys are the guys that are going to yeah. pay because because the World Series poker needs to have this ten million dollar guaranteed on it. Now, will they make you know the, uh, the enough people? Will they get enough people to to play where ten million is going to be pretty close to uh, what the payout would be anyway? Probably, but not. By a long shot, I mean I think the the risk is is much higher that it, they won't make it than they will. Uh, we've seen the numbers, you know, even last year with the full tilt refunds and everything. Uh, we didn't get you know some giant huge crazy amount in the in the main event. So. Uh, will it be down this year, uh, and and will we have a worse payout structure as a result? I I, I think it's kind of lazy marketing, to be honest, from by the World Series of Poker to do it this way. Um, I, I understand what they're trying to do. I think it's for, it seems to me, it's for the mainstream sort of media to be able to uh, promote the the tournament. So you know all the different magazines that aren't you know because poker mag nobody nobody in the poker world anybody who plays poker is going to go ahead and play the the main event just because it's 8 million or it's 10 million and not 8 million. I mean, right. th- you're going to so, play the main event, you're going to play it. Yeah, it's, it seems to me that the, the the World Series guys, you know, they've kind of got it, this PR guy buzzing in their ear saying the 10 million is a magic number. It's got to happen that there is this big difference. Uh, and, and, you know, I can see that in the mainstream media that 10 million is is – you know, could be seen as appreciably different as from 8.6 million or, or whatever the, the organic natural number would be for any given prize pool. Um, I can't argue that that's not necessarily true. Poker players, of course, are different. Poker players are very good at just being cold and rational and mathematic about this and saying like, wait, if the prize pool organically would be 8.6 million and you're just forcing it to be 10 million, then that's 1.4 million that's going to come from every other spot. Why? And, and what the most common thing that I keep seeing on Twitter or kept seeing from Twitter uh, last week was people saying, wait, you should probably just pay more spots. If your goal is to get the average you know, Joe Blow interested in this thing, well, the average Joe Blow doesn't really think he's going to win $10 million. Like He might dream about it and daydream and fantasize about it. But really, you see these guys, when they cash the main event, they are over the goddamn moon, right? Yeah. Like they are, you, you see what they, how they play leading up to the bubble. So, so they're, 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 you know, they're, they're white-knuckling the felt. The room goes they crazy can, when they, they announce can sweep the night. Yeah. The room goes absolutely ballistic. People are on their cell phones like crazy. Their wife, honey, I made it. It's, it's nuts. Like people come Come to Vegas hoping that people come to Vegas, the World Series, hoping that they can make day two. And then once they made day two, they're like, "Oh my God! If I could make the money, that would be amazing." It's a story when when somebody like like a, a Roberto Luongo or Paul Pierce or somebody like that make, makes the money. It, it's a story in itself. That's a that's a mainstream media story. Is it less of a story? If, you know, if if the world champion makes. 8.8 million or 8.3 million or, or whatever the number is like uh, I don't think the average person really thinks oh pff, 8.2 million I mean <laughs> yeah. I mean really like that's that's the thing but I mean but they they seem to have it stuck in their head that that there's a, there's a magic around 10 million 10 million and I I, I I can't say for sure that they're wrong. I mean, we do kind of have people do have a, tend to have a fascination with, with with big round numbers like that but I mean um yeah, I mean, I think everybody realizes that 8.x or 7.x and 9.x million is still a is still a really big ton of money. So after the announcement, a lot of uh, uh, MTT regulars uh, were not happy about it. Uh, David Baker, o- o- ODB, was was the main one who was coming out and talking about it on Twitter, and people were were uh, it was it was a huge issue for a little while. And uh, yeah. even Daniel Negreanu who wrote a blog. Uh, a quote from his blog was, top-heavy prize pools most definitely do have a damaging effect on tournament numbers, and the clearest example of that would be is if you offered a winner-take-all event. And and I don't, right. I, I'd kind of disagree with that. I don't think it's linear. I don't think you can just say uh, because you know nobody would play in a winner-take-all event that that this is, is much worse. I, I'm not sure that argument carries any water but but i know what he's saying and and uh if you if you paid three percent of the field you, you know i don't know uh it's something right. if you paid three percent of the field you would absolutely maybe not like that year you would harm the attendance but in future years you would dramatically harm the attendance like if you could run the simulator you would you would destroy the, the tournament by just paying three percent of the field i don't but i don't know that necessarily means that paying 15 percent of the field is better than paying 10 like that's yeah that's not 
a given, you know, by your, you know, as you just pointed out, right? Anyway, it's not, I don't think it's going to make a big difference. I, I, uh, it's just, to me, I don't, I don't think that it's uh, a good idea for the World Series of Poker to, to use the player's money like that. And, and, it's, and it's just frustrating that, that they always say that they're looking for, for honest feedback, they're looking for honest input, and then they got it, right? They, they got a lot of people saying, you know what, I, I, I know what you're saying, but I think this is a bad idea. And then they just take the opposite side of that argument, right? So, so it sounds like they came up with this idea. They got married to the idea, and when people they expected people to come out and love it, and when people didn't love it, now they had to dig in their heels and defend themselves on it. And that's what's kind of frustrating to me is 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 you if if you're going to go out there and seek an honest opinion, then you have to not reflexively rally against that honest opinion when you get it, right? Or else just don't ask for the opinion saying we're doing ten million. Right. So, but what they have done is uh, they they are taking some input from players. They've uh, they put out a survey online uh, that anybody can take. Um, they've decided that they're going to get some some feedback from the people that were complaining. Uh, the questions uh, I, I want to read off a couple of them. Uh, first, there's a bunch of screening questions. Have you played before? Do you plan on playing again this year? Um, then the, the next one is, uh, we're considering paying more places for the World Series of Poker main event. For example, last year, the World Series main event paid 693 places, with 693rd receiving 18,000, 100th place getting 52,000, and 10th getting 565,000. If we pay 1,000 places instead of 693, um, using the same amount of entrance, uh, 1,000th would probably receive around 15,000. Um, you know, so basically getting 5,000 back on their buy-in, uh, 693rd, uh, would then get 16,750, 100 spot would, uh, get half, uh, sorry, 50,000 and 10th would get 525,000. Are these pay, pay adjustments an acceptable compromise to increase the percentage of the field paid out from the standard 10% more along the lines of 15%. We see 15% of poker stars, right? I think that's pretty standard on, on MTTs. Yeah. If I remember correctly. So. And I'd also want to point out one thing here is that their numbers are kind of made up here and the reason why is because it's not necessarily true that you would have to pay a thousand to fifteen thousand because of what we just talked about which is you're assuming that we're going to keep the 10 million up top right if you don't keep the 10 million up top then you then then there's a sliding effect all the way down and all these spots can get paid more now it'll still end up being like not that much greater than that but what they've done is they've held the top payouts constant and then said okay well if we expand from paying 693 pay places to paying a thousand places and we pay an extra you know five percent of the field then these diminishes the prize pool so you, you know asking the the person to choose between choice a and choice b is ignoring choice c which is taking some money off the top and paying a larger percent of the field out of that money and th this is what frustrates me a lot about about this survey too. Is that, like I said, they seem so stuck in their own head on this that they're not willing to con consider possible alternatives, and they're they're pre kind of prevent presenting false alternatives. But yes, to your question, um, stars pays about fifteen percent of the field. I like the stars format for for gigantic uh, uh, you know MTTs. I think it, I think it's reasonable. Um, They've been messing with it for for a long time. I have no reason to believe that that I know better than 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 they do, and uh, what what they're doing with that. A lot of a lot of really smart people have worked on that for a really long time. So, so I don't know what are your thoughts on it. Um, I, I uh, honestly I like the payout structure the way it was. Uh, you know, ten, mm -hmm. eleven percent. Um, not with a with an you know just whatever the first price ends up being the standard percentage, not this ten million guarantee type thing. So. Um, I'm more, uh, you know, when I play a poker tournament, I, I want to hit it big. I, I'm, I don't want to, you know, min cash and get 15000 for my 10 or something like that. I, you right. know, I, I just, I, I think, but I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, no, some people really like the big bubble too because they think the bigger the bubble is, the more you can abuse it, uh, which, is certainly, which is certainly true. But a lot, of, a lot of times people kind of go in expecting that oh they're going to be the one abusing the bubble a lot of times they're they're the one folding down if the yeah. <laughs> if the bubble is like 3x to buy in so uh yeah I, I i i totally understand that i just the world series is is a is a the main event is in particular so, such a weird animal like you know people start stalling like way before the yeah. bubble and a lot of weird <laughs> stuff and go 
honestly, like if I were were the king of payouts, like most of what I would do would go towards like eliminating stalling and not uh, you know just doing whatever prize pool manipulation was necessary to to like minimize uh, the, the 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 advantage of stalling yeah. because that tilts me. Yeah, no question. It's a, it's a different animal than than really any other poker tournament you're going to play, especially getting down to uh, you know payouts and and things like that. Um, they go on to ask more questions about uh, what the minimum cash should be, what percentage people should pay. We'll we'll post a link um, in the show thread if you want to go take the survey. Feel free um, and put your input in there, and hopefully they take uh, they take what players have to say and and use it. And and uh, I guess we'll find out. It seems like they're ready to to listen anyway. Just to clarify, you mean people just like taking forever to act. When they're yes. stalling, yeah. To, so basically, break the bubble. when the bubbles, there's five away from the money. Before, what they do, they'll play hand for hand. You actually, it's more than five usually, isn't it? It's they'll play hand for hand around eight or ten. I want to say, Terrence, away from the bubble, yeah, and oh, before okay. that. So if there's twenty away, yeah. or thirty left, and you've got seventeen thousand. Um, every time it comes to you before the flop, you're sitting there thinking, humming and hawing for a couple of minutes and then folding that you're seven oh. deuce kind of thing. That kind of stuff goes on a, a fair amount. And, and, and it's, it's really a- hard to police in a, in a field that this big. Like, yeah. you know, if you're talking about a typical tournament where it's got like five tables close to the money, you've got a tournament director that's able to kind of come around and say, hey, knock it off. But uh, when you're talking about like literally hundreds of tables are cashing, then it's, it's a very hard thing to police. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. Uh, so let's get to some more stuff. We got a, we got some guests today, so we don't have uh, a ton of time to uh, uh, you know spend on each segment on some of this stuff. So let's try and power through it. Uh, Poker Stars has signed team pros in India and Japan. I mean, I think this is the environment right now. They've been letting a lot of pros go, um, and you know, a lot of people were talking about this is you know a cost saving measure. Uh, clearly, it doesn't seem that way. This seems like it's a uh, strategic measure now about which pros they keep and which pros um, they bring into the fold. And they, they have brought uh, the game is uh, it's doing quite well in India, Japan. I'm not exactly sure how it's going in Japan um, because there's some legal issues there. I think right with with being able to play in Japan, mm-hmm. but um, you know that seems obviously a, a, a huge market uh, as well. So. Uh, I, I'm going to try and pronounce it. I think of MJ when I try and pronounce these names. Uh, Aditya Ar- Agarwal. Aditya Agarwal has become the first ever Indian team pro uh, and can be found online at PokerStars playing as Adi Agarwal. Uh, Japanese player Kosai Ichinose. Uh, I'm not making that up. Kosei? Kosei? Itchy nose. I'm going to go with itchy nose just because, uh, from my incredible limited knowledge of Japanese, I think uh, they pronounce all the vowels in Japanese. Oh, do they? Itchy what about nose. MC Hot Dog? Why didn't they sign him? Who's MC Hot Dog? He was that guy that was at uh, the ACOP. They had the uh, on the booklet in Macau. They had uh, this big thing that apparently he was playing the main I, event. I, I, I will, I will yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will That's back. Uh, I will back Ross up on this one. Uh, yeah. He's he's a he's a like a, a, a celebrity. He's he's actually Taiwanese. Yeah. Oh, uh, MC, MC Hot Dog is a is like a, he's like a, a pop superstar <laughs> who uh, does play a little bit of poker over there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, from 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 Taiwan, unfortunately, not the 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 most critical market for Asia relative to at least. Oh, like, I Indian thought he was Japanese. Japanese. Sure. The uh, the Japanese pro will play under the screen name K Ichinose. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, Paul Flo <laughs> is uh, well. You know, I guess we could talk a little bit about uh, speaking of uh, Asian businessmen, but uh, anonymous. We won't. We'll, we'll leave that. Uh, Paul Paul Flo has asked a judge. He this uh, he was arrested in Las Vegas during the World Series of Poker for uh, bookmaking. There's uh, there's I think it was bookmaking, right? There was uh, uh, there's a big sort of kerfuffle going on in the courts about how the FBI. Uh, uh, ended up getting evidence and collecting evidence against these guys. They posed as computer techs and uh, pull, they pulled the internet from the room. So, of course, uh, Paul Foy calls down and says, our internet isn't working. Um, and then they send in the FBI to uh, to snoop around their place. Um, is this a you know an acceptable way to to gather evidence? I guess is what's going on there. Um, anyway, they are out on bail. Uh, Paul Fuan and his son, and they've asked the judge if they can uh, uh, because uh, when they're out on bail, they're not supposed to be playing poker or gambling. And they've asked the judge if they're allowed to play poker or tried to ask him if they will allow him to, them to play poker, which uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. I mean, if you're stuck in Vegas, you might as well. Uh, 
uh, sit and gamble, right? And and I'm, I'm sure there's a few people in uh, in Las Vegas that are hoping that he wins that. Yeah, uh, that's that's really me. it's like a, a compassionate release uh, round. <laughs> Please uh, let us do something. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Bluff Awards are out. The uh, the votes have been tabulated. Uh, the favorite web based poker show, and and uh, this is on a. Uh, I clearly had to be on the show after we we say the award show should not be a thing. <laughs> We're going to talk about the Bluff Awards. Out of the twelve categories this year, uh, this is a quote from from Bluff. Uh, the biggest victory, uh, the runaway victory, was in the favorite web based poker show. Jason Somerville with his run it up following. Um, they uh, they stuffed the ballot box. I think is what happened here. He he incentivized them somehow or another to go and vote seventy three times. Uh, he had sixty six percent of the vote. Well, uh, this uh, this very show here finished second with twelve percent, and uh, the Poker News podcast uh, right behind us at eleven uh, percent. We're so. all very disappointed in all of you. If you're listening to me, I uh, we're, we're no, we're not. Yeah. Uh, we you can't compete with the 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 juggernaut of Jason Somerville's army of of they're they're lunatics like the, these people yeah. are not normal like they <laughs> they like make figurines of him and shit like it's like he's running a cult over there like I I consider that that we, like we finished second like so we finished like we actually won among like the the people who are just normal like oh so man we win. No, I, mean, I mean that's correct yeah like it, it was it was ne- we were never going to win which is why I didn't even want to bring it up on the show like four weeks ago or whenever we were talking about because <laughs> we were never going to win J- like Jason Summer Somerville fans, they're they're just like an, on another planet of. There should of be a like subcategory of like fanboyism. Do you love Jason Somerville? Yeah, and, and then, then and then the vote for podcast. and then, and then the vote for some other show now. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. like it, it's not reasonable. We got to get a trophy and uh, and some hilarious trophy and send it off to him to uh, <laughs> so he can pass it around each year to the winner. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the, to go to go with all the the like the statues of his likeness that have been that's right like created, <laughs> they get lost on his shelf. Um, the uh, University of Alberta has claimed now that head up no lim- oh, sorry head up limit hold'em is officially solved, which Close call. is interesting. Um, uh, it, you know, there's you've been able to play the, uh, in a casino limit hold'em against a bot for a while. And presumably, mm-hmm. uh, the casino isn't going to put it in there if it's going to be pretty easy to beat. Um, so, except that they started charging rake for it, which kind of implied that people were beating it. Oh, they did. They, I didn't realize that. Yeah. They started so, so rake. what? So it wasn't that long ago where they actually. So, well, there were a couple things that that one always did. Like the heads up limit bot would would uh, would basically would steal your button if you want to pot over a certain size, and then li- later it started adding a rake. Um, so th- there was always like the implication that it's not as good. and. Not only that, it didn't give you rewards points. You know, usually, sure. uh, you know, you're playing a you're playing a minus EV casino game. They uh, they'll give the sl- they'll give you slot points if you insert your slot cub in there, so you can get a free buffet or a free hotel room or all this kind of stuff. And they very quickly uh, stopped giving points for that. So I'm not sure that that particular AI algorithm was better than all of the best heads up limit hold'em players that were hanging out in Las Vegas in that time. This one, however, I mean, they've been working on it for a really long time. Uh, the the U of A has been at this for. God, as long as I can remember, really, like oh, it feels like at least ten years. Yeah, uh, probably be up there on their website. But uh, yeah, they're like you know, like you said, sorry to interrupt, but they uh, they went out there and they they've said that okay, they've they've done it now. Limit hold them solved. We're done. <laughs> so. Yeah, we're gonna move on to the next thing. But I mean, like you said, they've been doing it for years. Uh, Phil Lack, uh, a lot of the early. I remember uh, a guy from Edmonton named Godham, and I can't remember what he played under. But he was one of the first guys to go ahead and play and battle the program. Um, they've been they've been staging these events for years. Um, but they said they made a, a, a pretty big breakthrough this year uh, with some some intelligence that they got from uh, uh, another guy that came in and helped them with the program. Um, the uh, it's called Cephas Cephas. I don't know how to pronounce it. Cephas Cephas, Cephas. Uh, to learn the game. Uh, Cepheus apparently spent two months playing more than a billion, billion hands of Texas Hold'em, and I thought it was kind of amusing that they, uh, a scientific place used the term billion, billion. Uh, uh, they say uh, more, more hands, they played more hands um, in that have ever been played in the entire, entirety of human history, which, uh, which is pretty impressive. 4,000 computer processors, each handling 6 billion hands every second, <laughs> were used... <laughs> Along with an algorithm that reviewed every decision and then learned which moves paid off and, and which cost it the hand. 
Um, now, I, I also read something where it said uh, it didn't, but it doesn't learn. Like it doesn't uh, adapt, uh, which I, I didn't understand. It seems like that. Well, would be it a, learns from itself. It doesn't. It, it learns from itself. It doesn't, doesn't adapt to the own. to the opponent. Right. Yeah, which would seem like to be the next next step. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's 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 harder to do, right? Like writing an writing a, an exploitive you know thing for for any you know an exploitative strategy involves you to open up your own strategy which means that you can be counter exploited and then that's how a lot of uh simplified game theory computation analysis works you kind of put two you know play two strategies against each other find out which one wins and which one where which one is vulnerable iterate do it over and over and over and over again and then eventually you have something that you consider to be the optimal strategy and and that's that, that's kind of how that works so the second you try to say oh well this guy actually folds too much on the turn so i'm going to start bluffing him more on the turn now you open yourself up to Another a counter strategy, which is basically to be calling station on turn. So you know that, and that's how you you iterate over and over. So um, for those that uh, don't know, can you give us a quick breakdown of game theory optimal GTO versus exploitative? Sure. There's there's a lot of misconceptions, and I was sort of uh, you know there's a there's a a thread in MVG about this this particular topic. Um, I believe the subject line is "Computer Conquers Texas Hold'em Poker for First Time," which is the same as uh, whatever mainstream article posted this. And there there are a bunch of misconceptions going on there. And the first, I guess, the most important one is the idea that if somebody is playing a game theoretic optimal equilibrium strategy, it 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 can't actually win against people, which is probably terrible, right? So uh, the genesis of this idea comes from, say, the the game, game theoretic optimum of a, of like a game like like rock paper scissors, right? So the the perfect strategy for rock paper scissors is to pick rock thirty three percent, paper thirty three percent, scissors thirty three percent, and no matter who you are, you can't beat the strategy, obviously, because right. if as long as it's random, you're you're going to win thirty three percent of the time. Um, but the the but poker is not like that, right? Poker involves payouts. Poker involves uh, the the possibility of of you know bet, betting and and an increased game space and the probability of winning and winning percentage and all of that. So if if a person deviates from optimal strategy at all and it is playing against an optimal strategy, the optimal strategy can only gain. It doesn't necessarily gain. It doesn't necessarily win, but it can only gain and it can never lose. Right. So, for example, if your optimal strat, if if you're sorry, if you as a human, as Adam, your mistake is that you fold too much on the turn, a game theoretical strategy is not going to realize this and, like I said, bluff you too much on the turn. But its correct betting percentage will just automatically exploit you. Will automatically take advantage of this hole and make a small gain from that. It's not as big of a gain as say like if Phil Ivey was playing you and he realized you fold too much on the turn and he starts making that adjustment of bluffing you more on the turn and then when you go back to calling him down more then he starts bluffing you less and it goes back and forth but it will always make money from you so that's what the the sort of I guess scary idea of 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 a solution to any game is whether it's limit hold them no limit hold them PLO whatever because uh, because it's basically the perfect strategy Right, it's yeah. it's the perfect strategy. It, it's a it's a strategy that can't be beaten, and that means that, um, you know that that means that in theory, if the game is solved, then there shouldn't after some time there shouldn't be any money left in it. Right. What are you doing using your big school words? Just use normal people words, and I'll understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so I'm a bit covered. Getting back to it, though, the 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 study or 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 the the Cephas. Cephas, <laughs> Cephas, I'll get it one of these days. Uh, it's comforting a bit that it's taken this long. Like we said, it's been, they've been at it for what, ten years or something, and and it's taken sort of this long to get to this point um, with sort of small um, increases in the effectiveness of this uh, of the uh, of the bot. So uh, it's a bit comforting, right, T, that that it's taken this long for sort of this simple form, not simple, but beca- I mean, it because uh, you don't know that you don't know that they're the first. Right, they're just the first who happens because they well, work for I mean, the university. Well, I mean, they so spent a lot they of they spent a lot of resources on it. So you would think that if they aren't the first, um, I, I don't know that there's enough money in Limit Hold'em Heads Up, um, f- you know, to spend the amount of resources that that these people have. You know, I don't know before. about that. I, I, I mean, I don't know what their research grant is, I and mean, we could a- we could ask them. But I, I think I think if you 
you know, I made, I personally, I was far from a, a perfect player and I made a lot of money playing Limit Hold'em. I have a lot of friends playing made Limit Hold'em. I know lots of people have made Limit Hold'em. If you find a solution that was, you know, 5 BB 100 better than everybody else. Yeah. Uh, and and a perfect solution is probably it, it's probably at least two or three maybe a hundred better than everybody else that any any human that exists. Then why, you know, then why would you tell anybody about it? You would be it, it, there's definitely incentive to do it. Whether the skill to do it is is hard, right? Because you need really smart people uh, who know a lot about computer science, who know a lot about mathematics, who know a lot about poker to 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 be involved and collaborate on this kind of project. It wouldn't be surprising if they weren't the first. It's possible that they are the first. But to me, it's always, you know, uh, that, that's why I'm always, like, skeptical uh, to some extent. Like, yeah, these guys work for a university, but I, I kind of feel like if these guys were so motivated to, to do this project, it, it's, it's, it's weird that they're, they're motivated purely for academic purposes because I think they could have made a, a, a bunch of money off of it if they, if they definitely were right, whether it's licensing the software to the, the heads-up limit hold the machine, whether it's beating the hell out of the heads-up limit hold the machine, whether it's playing <laughs> 1,000, 2,000, um, you know, and beating all of all the, the, the heads-up uh, limit hold them specialists in the world. I mean, I, I imagine those games still run. I don't know. But uh, I have to think that they could have made a lot of money off of it. But um, that, that's, I mean, you can't do that, obviously, with university money. But, you know, these, these are, we're at some point at least private people. So I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they have a true solution, but, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's one of these things that's hard to know, too, right? Because when, when they solved, when they, when they basically figured that the best, com, uh, the best computer was better than the best human at chess. All they had to do was find the best human that they knew and play him at the best computer that they knew, and well, the computer won. But um, it would take so long for that to happen in, in you know, limit hold'em where the edges are so small, like, and we don't know, really actually know who the best player is anyway. That you know, we'll we'll never really know whether the, their solution is is a truly the best solution, but. Good for uh, them, anyway. But doesn't it seem like limit hold'em, head up, limit hold'em, would be the sort of the easiest form of poker to solve? Or am I wrong on that? Oh, uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, like heads up, five card stud would obviously be easier. But yeah, Sorry, out of the common, yeah, yeah, the most commonly played games, then then pro yes, limit hold'em would would be uh, the stud games would be harder because of the up cards and the changing position and, and that kind of thing. Pot limit and no limit would obviously be harder because you add branches to the tree, triple draw. You're adding twice as many branches to the tree because you've got the betting decision and the discard decision. So yeah, Limit Hold'em is, is unquestionably, Heads of Limit Hold'em is unquestionably the easiest game to solve, uh, which is, I'm sure, why they chose it to begin with. If you want to play against the bot, uh, you can go to the website, Google uh, University of Al Alberta Poker. Um, they've got it set up there so you can battle against the bot. Also, they, uh, they lay out the preflop strategy as well uh, in a graph, uh, if you want to have a look at that. Um, what do you think the most unsolvable game is uh deep stack uh plo uh, deep stack no limit right now like it, it it would it would well i mean it could still be something like um you don't think it's deep no stack limit. plo it could well the the thing about plo is it's constrained by pot size right so the thing the thing about no limit that makes it harder is you could but theoretically there could be a solution where on on certain streets like betting four times the pot's correct that that like the computer has to try to figure out whether this is true or not, and how it how it responds to like somebody betting four sides four times the pot or something. What? Even even like a weird game like No Limit Stud might might involve some weird things because now you've got a a, a river card that's down. You've got changing position on every street, and you've got um you know you've got lots of weird. Uh, stuff going on with that, so it's possible that it, it might be something bizarre like like no limit stud, <laughs> or n I think no limit deuce to seven single or, or triple draw. That seems like it would be pretty complicated. Yeah, no limit triple draw deuce would be. Stack. It wouldn't be no limit single draw because the fact that there's only two streets would make yeah. makes the game easier. No limit triple draw. The thing I would worry about that is for a lot of stack sizes, you're just going to be all ship. in uh, yeah. before the last draw anyway. Yeah. You're going to ship early, and that's going to shut right. out all the different decisions that that would come up later. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's take it to break. Uh, when we come back, we are going to be joined by uh, Joe Ingram, Chicago Joey. Uh, Ch Chicago Joey. <laughs> I always get it backwards. Joey Chicago. Joey Chicago's a DJ. I want to ask him if he, <laughs> ah. if he knows uh, Joey Chicago at all. But uh, Chicago Joey is going to join us uh, after the break. You're listening to 2 Plus 2 PokerCast, presented by the PokerStars VIP Club. More right after this. 
Hey guys, this is Bart Hansen for CrushLivePoker.com. Whether you're a recreational player who wants to compete at the tables, or you're a professional and you want to increase your win rate, the material that I've produced at CrushLivePoker.com will make you a better poker player. Act now and you can subscribe for free by using the coupon code TPC11. That's TPC for the PokerCast11 and get your first month free. Hi guys, it's Mike from ProfessionalPoker.com and the 2 Plus 2 store with some great news for our PokerStars players. You can now use your frequent player points to purchase gift cards available from ProfessionalPoker.com. The same cards will also work at the 2 Plus 2 store. The gift cards come in increments of $25 and $50, and you can apply multiple gift cards per order. So now you can get the books, videos, and ebooks from all the major publishers using just your FPPs. So check out the gift card section of the PokerStars FPP store and pick up the poker training material you've had your eye on for a while at the 2 Plus 2 store and professionalpoker.com. I blinds 120k, 240k. It's folded to me in the cutoff and I raise ace-king off to 480,000 with a stack of 14.6 million. Button folds and a small blind 3 best of 1.25 million with an effective stack of 8.9 million. I've played with the guy some in previous days. I felt he wouldn't flat call many hands from the small blind and was capable of getting out of line pre-flop. I 4 bet to 2.15 million with the intention to call his shove. He went all in, I quickly called and he also had ace-king off. The flop came down with 3 clubs. I had the king club but he had the ace of club. The turn was another club and I doubled him up. Team Pro Online's Marc Andre French Dog Ladouceur is a supernova elite VIP. This is the 2 Plus 2 Pokercast, presented by the PokerStars VIP Club. Welcome back to the 2 Plus 2 Poker Cast presented by the Poker Stars VIP Club. Uh, this is PCA week, uh, but three guys who are not at the PCA are myself, uh, Terrence, who's uh, arguably in a better spot in Bali, and uh, our guest this week, uh, Chicago Joey. Uh, Joe Ingram, uh, at Joe Ingram 1 uh, on Twitter. Joey, welcome to the Poker Cast. Oh, it's uh, it's good to be back on here again. <laughs> it's been a while, yeah. We uh, I remember back in the days we had you on when you were doing all those crazy challenges, the fifty k hands in a day. Uh, that's uh, that's what you were known for early, right? The, all the prop bets. Yeah, I think the first time I came on here was in two thousand eight when I did the uh, six hundred thousand hands in a month, and then you guys <laughs> had me maybe back on again briefly. I think I came on again. I think it might have been after the 50,000 hands in a month one, too. Yeah. Or yeah. 50,000 hands in a day. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been, a, been a couple of years. Are you doing any, any of those any th- prop bets anymore? You, you, that's, that's a thing of the past, right? Um, I mean, they're, it's just living in the United States. There's yeah. less opportunities. I did a play money chip, play chip prop bet on Poker Stars. <laughs> I tried to go from um, 1,000 play chips, what you start with, to to 20 million and i bet uh, 17,000 with my live stream people that watch my stuff and i thought this would be easy but it turns out it's very hard because people take the play chips very seriously on poker stars for some unknown reason <laughs> do they really They're, so yeah i've never played the the, the play chip was those guys they get all mad when you suck out on them and stuff well no you, you'd be like oh play chips they're they don't, who cares but play poker stars has this whole economic system with their play chips where they sell them so people like very, they, they play very seriously at the higher stakes play chips, and they get rake the games too. It's kind of a what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what? Uh, so you're not you're in the U.S. You're back in Chicago. Tell us about uh, some of your travels. Are you spent some time here in Vancouver uh, to uh, to play online poker? Uh, give us uh, give us an idea where your stops and uh, and and where you've where you've set up shop. Yeah, I was living in Vancouver for. Almost a year. I lived in Vancouver for almost a year, and then I left there and went to Europe for a little while, and I happened to meet a woman over in Spain, or a girl, a woman, and we did some traveling around. She mentioned, she's like, why don't you move to Australia? We can 
we can be together. I said, well, we can play online poker in Australia, so I'm in. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah, and, and I like you too, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, was, so you were in Australia for a while? Where'd you go, Melbourne? Or? Uh, I was living in Sydney for about six months. And how, how, did that, uh, how, did that, how did the date end, I guess, is the question. Well, not well. T- t- turns out when you're, when you're on an upswing and you make, a, you make plans to move to a different country to date a girl, it, it sounds good. But when you move there in a downswing, you're slightly more focused on playing poker and you're l- less focused on the actual girl. So <laughs> She didn't like that too much. Yeah, they, they don't tend to like that. <laughs> uh, they don't see both sides all the time. But yeah, so I, I wanted to get into some of your poker playing before we get to the podcast. Uh, you started off in No Limit Hold'em. You're now Mr. PLO guy. Uh, give us a breakdown of, of the, well, I mean, your, your podcast is fantastic. I mean, everybody, you know, you play, uh, you know what's going on in the high stakes PLO world, but, um, eat, sleep, PLO, eat, sleep, PLO. Yeah. Um, your, uh, your transition from no limit, hold to PLO, uh, give us a breakdown exactly, uh, what your, what, why that happened. Is, is it just PLO is a more fun game for you? Hmm. Let me try to think back. That was, a, that was a few years ago. That was before. The, the government changed the laws here. I think it was just I tried PLO because I think at the time you could get more VPPs per hand at PLO as compared to No Limit. So I started playing that. And then I just, I mean, it's like kind of an addicting game. You get four cards. It's, it's a lot of fun, especially when you play No Limit for so long and you feel like there might be, uh, you might not be able to get much better than than what you are at the time just because I feel like people back then were, you know, pretty far ahead in terms of skill level. So once I started playing PLO, you kind of see that the games are uh, a bit softer and the regs aren't quite as good. So, and then I just kind of got hooked from there and yeah. I just, so you're yeah. back in Chicago. Uh, I assume you're obviously not playing poker stars now. Is it, uh, that's where it seems like a lot of the PLO action is, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's some other place that I don't know, but um, did, was it you wanted to uh, just be back in Chicago and you didn't want to play uh, at Stars or you found better places? What's what's sort of the process there? Well, I guess I came back from Australia and I never, I haven't lived around my parents or my family or my some of my friends from back here pretty much since I was 21. I moved, I moved to the, I moved away from where I grew up at. So being back around here was, you know, my little brother just turned 15. He's uh, you know, I've never really got a chance to hang out with him, see my mom, see my stepdad. So I kind of just uh, it was embracing that. And then, as always, with seems with my life, I met a girl, and uh, we started we started dating, and we dated for about a year and a half, which is the reason why I still lived around here. So that's, that's interesting. It. You know, to you know. It, you know, we just obviously come into the new year, Joey, and a lot of people, uh, you know, like yourself, around the time of the new year, they they're going to set uh, volume goals for themselves. You know, it's uh, you you've obviously one of the highest volume players of 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 all time in online poker history. Do you have uh, some volume goals for for 2015 that you want to hit, and how does that reconcile with uh, seeing a new girl in uh, in in the United States, or are you going to take her up to Canada or Mexico? Well, technically, now we broke up about. Uh, oh, a I'm months sorry ago. to hear that. Okay. <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, it's, um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, you know, you know, it's okay. But from now, from this point on, you know, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do in terms of volume. I think I'm more focused on profit now as compared to volume. Before it was really my goals were really supernova elite driven, and you know, I wanted to play as many hands as I possibly could, and I just really, really enjoyed mass tabling. And I think in the past couple of years, my my goals have kind of shifted to being more uh, worried about pro- worry about just profit maybe shorter sessions maybe not you know 24 hour marathon sessions like i used to enjoy doing it, is Do there plo an- sorry oh, t sorry is there yeah. plo available in other than stars or out there that that uh, oh there, yeah there's a ton of i mean there's a ton of action even just on some sites you can play uh, in america that the sites that won't steal your money you can play bovada you can play america's Cardroom. And I mean, in terms of the untracked Euro sites, I don't know how much you guys talk about the untracked Euro sites around here. The untracked Euro sites you, you offer can talk, plenty. You can of talk about anything you want. Yeah, no, feel free. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, the, there's you know, there's this there's this like, there's this thing where people you know, for people that live in the United States, they don't really talk much about the untracked Euro sites, but that's where most of the Americans that live live in the USA play. Yeah, I, I want to s- take a step. 
back t- a little bit to you know when you talk about maximizing profit versus maximizing volume. I think uh, I think obviously you know to some ex- extent every poker player has that goal. It's just that the maybe the less talented or less skilled ones um, are able to maximize profit by maximizing volume because you know their edge isn't as big or they're not able to to play as high stakes. Um, you know how have you have you sort of figured out an optimum level in terms of session length, in terms of of how many tables to play, and 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 how how long did it take for you to to come to the process of figuring out okay this is this is how much volume I should play to get the most kind of dollars, uh, most bang for my buck. It's a really good question because it's something I've thought about that probably. I mean, way too much time. Uh, I've thought about <laughs> what's the balance. You know, where's the where's the line between you know, figuring that out. And as you said, that there's some people who feel like that they maximize their profit by playing more. But I feel like for myself, I really needed to play way less tables, focus on how I can get better, the mistakes I was making, and kind of just trust that by me doing that and putting in hours, I'll start making more money than I would have made previously, where if I was, you know, 12 tabling, for six to eight hours, knowing if I hit a small win rate, I would make this money. I guess that now I see it that if I just keep working on my game, getting better and better, but playing less tables, I'm going to make two times more than what I would have made with my old strategy. Do you find yourself getting better? Like, uh, did you see exponential jumps in your in your results and your ability and your sort of self, uh, you, you know, awareness of how, how good of a player you were? Like, did that come fairly fast? No. I, well, the, the, there was the only, only, I only changed one thing, which was I stopped 24 tabling PLO. So it turns out when you 24 table PLO, it might be slightly harder to win if, you, if you're only four tabling. So right after I won my, I won my Supernova Elite prep, at, I was in Vancouver. I stopped 24 tabling. I started four to six tabling. And pretty much ever since that point, I've been winning at, a, I guess, an okay amount, depending on the month. And that was pretty much the major change I did. I just stopped mass tabling PLO. Uh, how much do you pay attention to uh, the games at Stars? Uh, the, 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 you know, it seems like you, t- you guys have a lot of guests, or you have a lot of guests on your show that are sort of playing the 2550, that kind of thing, the big, the big PLO guys. Uh, is it something you pay a lot of attention to, or not really? I think uh, you kind of have to pay attention to it just doing a PLO like podcast and having the guests on there. There's a lot of people now at this point that are on Skype. They'll always message me like Chad and hand histories of, of some fun hands that people might've played, or they kind of tell me, you know, who's winning or who's losing. So, and that kind of keeps me up to date. I don't really like watch much action, but in between that and the high stakes hands posted on two plus two and the NBG, you kind of get a feel for what's happening. Uh, so let's talk about the podcast. Uh, the uh, The original idea, if I remember correctly, was uh, you wanted to go kind of through the high stakes hands that were being played that are getting posted in NVG and uh, go over some of the PLO hands. Is that right? And and it morphed into you know guests and uh, and sort of doing the things that you do now. Yeah, it started off. The format I started off with was the PLO hand histories and. I really enjoyed doing that, but I did like four of those episodes, and I think I realized that it would be it would be better if it would be cool if I could include the people whose hands I was featuring. So, for instance, the first guest I had on was was a guy K.R. Mont twenty two Kyle Montgomery, and I talked about his hands. His hands were like the the main focus of a few of the episodes. So I was like, oh, it'd be great if now I could have him on. And it kind of just accidentally happened. Once I had him on, I was like, oh, that was a really good idea. I, maybe I should have more guests on and then do less hand histories. And then from that point, it kind of just, you know, I thought I, I reached a certain point. I had a bunch of mainly PLO guests on. And then I thought that, that I probably should try to branch out and have more people from, you know, the reg, I guess the no limit world, the live world and stuff like that. That way more people could potentially find the podcast and give it a listen instead of just seeing uh, you know, high stakes PLO podcast and immediately saying, well, I don't want to listen to that. I don't play any PLO and I don't know how to play PLO. A lot of people don't understand reverse blockers either. Yeah. Explain, <laughs> explain what reverse blockers are. <laughs> I, know, I think, uh, I know Terrence, Terrence, Terrence plays a lot of poker. I, I he, he's probably a big reverse blockers, uh, <laughs> proponent, I would assume. I don't know if I'm missing an inside joke or if you literally mean reverse, having reverse <laughs> blockers. Like, yeah. 
I think he means well, it, and it's a joke. It's both. It's, it's, yeah, it's definitely it's like a, a very merged uh, definition. Of it. <laughs> it's a t- uh, concept, but yeah, reverse blockers, for instance, in PLO, you you know you have two, three, six, seven. The flop comes ace king ten. Well, now you have reverse blockers to queen jack. And, <laughs> ah, okay. You know the better the, the the I think the top GTO minds out there right now, like Hollywood <laughs> Haxton and maybe Sean Lafort, they can figure out a way to put reverse blockers into their game plan. Whereas some people are. Are still a bit behind in the times. Hollywood Haxton, yeah, Hollywood Haxton. You know Hollywood. You know Hollywood Ike Haxton, right? <laughs> I, I, I love the name. I, I hadn't heard Hollywood Haxton before. Oh, that's uh, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I, did you give that to him, or is is that his actual nickname? Well, there was a time it was we were live streaming some PLO and <laughs> and, Ho- and Hollywood Haxton bet near the pot on the river he left himself five hundred dollars at 5100 and he tanked down for about a minute and a half and folded i was like what's hollywood haxton doing <laughs> so and ever since then i've just co- been calling him hollywood haxton and i think someone else someone in the uh there was a thread in newsies gossip and they said that he kind of plays his persona in poker is kind of uh you know successful and this you know this like guy at the top he's kind of like hollywood so i think the na- nickname really works well for him <laughs> I actually thought it, like it, it's almost the perfect ironic nickname because if you try to think of a guy who's less flashy and more substance than Ike Haxton, like it's it's really right. hard because yeah. this is a guy who's all substance. Yeah, yeah I love it. He, he's, he's as unHollywood as it gets. <laughs> right, right. Um, the quote I saw Joey about the podcast was, uh, uh, "It's it's just not fun to compliment everybody and say that they're all good and everybody's a winning player. It's not true, <laughs> and I want to talk some shit about people, so I'm going to start my own podcast." Where'd you read that? Yeah, I can't remember. What are you guys I was, thinking at? I, I loved it. I thought it was funny. And, uh, and, well, uh, you know, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, you guys do a great job of being very politically correct, I feel like, with, uh, <laughs> you've always done a really good job at that most, most We're of your just time. Canadian. I think, is that a compliment or not? I don't think that's a compliment. <laughs> that's definitely a compliment. <laughs> no, you, guys, you guys are like, you guys, you know, you, Mike and Adam back in the day, like my podcast aspiration, you, Bart Hansen, you guys, I, I pretty much listened to. I mean, fuck, I can't even remember how many hours and hours of, of podcasts between the 2 plus 2 poker casts I've listened to. So it's, I so can't remember the actual first question, but I know I was just thinking about that in my head right now. So you're the guy that's listened to all the shows. You're the one guy. That's well, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but on the other hand, so you, you talked about, you know, you know you're, you're quoted, and, and I don't know where Adam dug up this quote about, uh, you know, how you want to talk shit about everybody. At the same time, you tweeted, what, like uh, five days ago, four days ago, that now your, your coach is telling me that you have to be uh, more, more PC and not, not firing <laughs> shots at poker players. So, wh- which, oh, which uh, Chicago go, Joey, are going to get in 2015? The one that talks mad shit about people or, <laughs> or the one that's going to be a bit more uh, PC? I think I, I think I don't talk mad shit i talk I, I i fire some shots at a couple choice people in the plo community for sure and i'm, I'm gonna keep firing shots at those choice people in the plo community f- until uh, until something changes but no nah, i'm gonna be try to be a little bit more politically correct i have to ask now who these choice people are in the po- in the plo community <laughs> obviously everybody out there is going all right who is it i think they won some awards in the hs plo oh did they yeah. <laughs> the high stakes yeah. plo awards for 2014 yeah. That was just something I made up. It seemed like a fun idea that when I was making it up at the time. Uh, in terms of, yeah, I don't want to talk about anybody, anyone's names right now. Nobody in specific? All right, fair enough. Nobody, nobody specific. He's listening to his coach. <laughs> yeah, he is. Um, one of the things that uh, we, we were talking about this earlier on the show, Joey, and that was uh, GTO versus Exploitive, and, and I was watching the uh, Greg Merson podcast, the recent one that you did, and uh, he said something interesting. Uh, you know, GTO isn't for everyone, and he was explaining... Um, playing against some of the Germans, I believe, and uh, his thought pro- his thought process there. Um, I thought that was in here. What's your what's your sort of take on the, on that whole thing? I guess what's the what's exactly is the question. What's my take well, on? You, yeah, you seemed a little baffled. I, I you know I watched that too. You seemed a little bit baffled. Merson said, you know, GTOs isn't isn't for everyone, and and you know your your response to this, you know. It, you know, was was sort of you. You tried to probe him a little bit on on um, you know how he would handle it. But what what is your sort of thing? You know, we talked. To, the reason why we talked about this, uh, you know, you weren't around for this, is because the University of Alberta has said that they basically solved limit hold'em, and then 
the idea being, well, if you can solve one form of poker, you can solve another form. Uh, and then, you know, Merson kind of comes on your show and says, well, all these guys, they're, they're trying to play GTO. So, so I'm not going to try to beat them at, at their game. Uh, what's, what's the, I guess what your, the question is, what's your, what's your take on how you try to play or what, what Greg, what your interpretation of, of what, uh, what Greg thinks proper strategy is in those spots? Oh, I see what you're saying. I remember what you're referencing now. I think we were talking about the uh, the high stake high stake six max games on Poker Stars. Yeah. He was mentioning playing with some of those guys, the Russian people, who we felt like uh, just played like GTO in, in a bunch of different situations, and he didn't really, uh, I guess. And P- oh, I think about it. I don't think about it much in terms of for no limit. I really rarely think about no limit play in terms of PLO. I mean, it's nothing that I really hear anyone that I talk a lot of poker with really like try to incorporate into their play style when it comes to Palom and Omaha specifically. I know Lafort talks about it sometimes, but that's more heads up orientated. I don't really play much heads up. So, you know, I I don't even know what people would consider prop if they're, what would be the definition of playing GTO in some situations at Palom and Omaha. I'd be curious to hear some people explain some ideas they have regarding it because it's kind of a mystery i think right now whereas at no limit i think people have a better idea of you know what gto in situations might actually be well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very much with you. I think that we're probably for both No Limit and Palom and Omaha, I think we're, we're very far from uh, any sort of GTO solution, at least right now. And you see that in the sense that people's styles do tend to be very different. And if there was uh, you know, a style that was discovered, first of all, I think that guy, that guy, whoever was playing it, would actually be smashing people. And there's not a whole lot you could do about it. Yeah, I, 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 I mean... I'm genuinely interested to see if if somebody out there like has something even thought about it. PLO, I, I, just, the spots are are just incredibly unique in, in terms of different board texture and the different range of hands you can have and your opponent can have in certain situations. Uh, it's yeah, I mean it's. I think we're a long time away from PLO, and but it does seem like most of the no limit players seem to think that it's. You know, by every month passes by, people are kind of starting to figure it out more and more. Uh, is there a player out there, Joey, that you kind of look at and, and maybe thought, what the fuck is this guy doing in this spot? Or, or you know, this guy's awful type thing. And then, because when I play PLO, a, a lot of the times I'll, I'll you know, I'll play, I'll play a guy a fair amount because I'll play the Zoom and I'll, I'll run into the same guy. I think, Jesus, he's terrible. And then it turns out he's there every day and he's winning every day. And, and you kind of, well, maybe he's not so terrible but because there's a whole bunch of different you know, ways to play. And, and is there a guy in the high stakes community that, that you've ever looked at and gone, what the hell's this guy doing? And then, and then turns out to be you know, something interesting that he's doing. There's actually is one person. Uh, that's my, my Chilean mining friend, Alexo18. His, uh, his screen name is Alexo18 on Poker Stars. I thought, you know, we've battled for... We play, used to play a lot, but even in recent, when I saw some hands, I was like, "God, this guy is fucking awful!" Like, there's no, uh, there's no way this guy's a winning player. And then, you know, he looked him up on Russian PTR, and he was up four hundred thousand dollars at Palom in Omaha. So I had to rethink my, had to rethink my whole entire uh, theory on his play. How uh, how are those games? Uh, are they, you know, do you think about Poker Stars back in the day when the when the games were great and and maybe they're not as good now, but are, are those games sort of in, in their glory days now? Are which games in the, the games glory? that you're talking about in the uh, the sites in Europe? No, no, no. These games are not in their glory days. No, no they're, they're not very good. <laughs> no, not in the glory. Not like before, where you'd you'd have a, a couple fun players at, at a ten twenty table or twenty five fifty table on stars, and there'd be many tables to choose from if that table broke whereas now the options are you know very limited and when you do play the higher stakes of stakes that you play you really have to run well in those shots or in those play because sometimes you don't get the to get that chance very often to make that money back how willing would you be to be if if say you know PLO was always a game for the longest time everybody said that you know no limits the dominant game but PLO is going to be the game to learn if you really want to make money it turned out to be 
to a, to a large extent to be true because of these glory days you're talking about. If there were a new you know PL, uh, PLO on the horizon, how willing would you be to kind of divert? Your, you know, you've obviously spent a ton of resources and and mental energy learning PLO to to dive into a new game. You know, as a PLO specialist. I think um, I think I'm pretty f- focused on PLO for the foreseeable future. I don't think I'll ever, or I don't not say ever, but. I don't think any time in the in the near future I would think about learning a new game. I just feel like it's so hard to to put your focus into a, learning a new game while playing another game. It's that was one of my biggest uh, leaks. I think when I was trying to learn PLO, is I would play X amount of time playing PLO, and then I'd play the other half playing No Limit, and that was definitely the biggest thing that held me back in terms of getting better at a faster rate at PLO. It's interesting because in Europe, uh, for the longest time, forever, that I, you know, the first days that I've been over there, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, they've been playing PLO pretty much, you know, just PLO and cash games in, in most of the cities that you run into in Europe. Um, but you don't see that. It hasn't happened to that extent yet in the U.S. And, and uh, a bit surprising because, you know, PLO is obviously more fun to play. It's a, more of a gambling game. And, and you would think that uh, it, it would take over, but it, it seems like maybe because it's we, all we see is No Limit Hold'em on TV or what have you, that right. uh, that it hasn't sort of taken over here. No, I think I would. I was going to say that that I think it's just because all, everything that's been on television for people in America has always been No Limit Hold'em tournaments, cash games. There's been there was one week or two weeks of PLO uh, Poker After Dark, a cash game that ever was on television. So. Until more people are exposed to the game, it's really hard for them to even know what it is or know it exists. Obviously, they go to a casino, they might see there's a 1-2 or a 2-5 game on the board. But for the most part, they have no idea what to do or how to play or how to learn how to play. So they're just going to keep playing No Limit. And you know, gra- gradually, I feel it's spreading a bit, but obviously the rate is very slow. And you know, who knows if it'll... Who knows if it'll ever improve, but hopefully it does. We've seen a lot of live streaming of, uh, of you know different players now uh, on Twitch and, and different places. Uh, how much of that do you watch? How uh, how interested are you in it? Uh, doing it yourself, etc. I, th- I think it's great for the games. The streamers I've watched, I on- I've really only watched Sticky Rice. Uh, have you guys you guys have talked about yeah, Sticky Rice? Sure, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, dude, that Absolutely. guy's. Are- <laughs> It's not <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. You know, and it's like so. People say, "Why aren't there more guys like this? Why aren't there more sticky rices? There should be bring me fifty more sticky rices." And the problem with that is, all those guys are he's he's terrible. He's not very good. So all those guys are going to go busto rather quickly. And then you know that's why there aren't guys like that streaming. But overall, I think streaming is great for the games. It feels like Twitch is really starting to focus on it for some reason. I, I don't know exactly why they're focusing on poker because you know it just it's going to cr- help or it's going to bring more people into playing poker and I, I mean, I don't know why Twitch would want that necessarily. But, you know, I think it's great for the games and I think it's great for people to do because you, you you'll find that you're more you're more motivated just to work harder and play more because you have these people out there that might be paying attention to you or be fans of you or want to watch you play. There's a guy uh, streaming PLO, 2-5 PLO, Alex KP. Do you know this guy? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, 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 yes. You do? <laughs> okay. There's uh, been a big, uh, yeah, there were, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a big kerfuffle with you guys or something? <laughs> you set me up for this one, aren't you? No, uh, might, yeah. I'm not. I'm not at all. I, uh, I've actually watched this guy stream because I play uh, Zoom PLO myself, and I saw something about a prop bet or something that you tweeted, or was it you tweeted? I, I can't remember. Something that you two had a prop bet. I honestly have no idea what what happened between you two. Yeah, well, you know, he might have said I was like a, I was a I was a fun regular on the stream, so I was like, well, why don't we do a prop bet? Two five Zoom, whoever makes the most profit will bet fifty thousand dollars on the side and let's let's go. Let's see what happens. And so his response to this was to post something that basically was just trying to make things up to make himself seem like less of a pussy for saying no when in reality he's you know, he could have just said, No, I don't want to. I don't think I'd I I would beat you in that prop bet, but he chose to go a different route and uh and yeah, I mean I wish he would take me up on the prop bet. But he said you're a fun regular? 
Yeah, you said I'm a, I'm a fun player. I'm a losing player. Oh, so yeah. I, I felt like you know, well, that seems like the perfect person to make a press. Yeah, about. yeah. He's gonna player. he's gonna want to like, think he has an edge. Right, like, a losing player is gonna give me fifty thousand dollars to to beat him in a pre- uh, He's losing. He's he's not gonna win anyway. Oh, well, that sounds like a pretty good bet. I feel like he would he would be pretty excited to take that, but wasn't down. I guess not. So. Uh, a, a fellow here in Vancouver, a mutual friend, I think, Mark uh, MD uh, Hughes here, was asking on Twitter about, he said to uh, ask you about the story that you were, you almost bought a Ferrari here in Vancouver. What, uh, what happened there? Well, 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 <laughs> you guys know Stars Reg problems, right? We do, yeah. You've heard of them. Okay. So Certainly. he happened to come, he happened to be in Vancouver for that week. And uh, we went driving around in my car there, and I was talking about wanting to, wanting to buy a Ferrari while I was up there. So we went to the Ferrari dealership. He convinced me. I didn't want to go. He's like, let's go to the Ferrari dealership. <laughs> so I said, all right, let, fine, let's go. Like, they're not going to let me test drive our Ferrari. This right. is not going to work. So we went in there. We go to the front desk, and I'm dressed pretty nice. He's, he's Stars Reg Problems. He's dressed like how you'd imagine Stars Reg Problems might be dressed. <laughs> And uh, talked to the front desk girl. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'd like to talk to somebody about, uh, about you know, maybe, maybe seeing a Ferrari or looking at what you guys have or maybe dr- test driving one. And I'm introduced to this nice young Asian man. He actually is pretty old. And we get to talking for a while. <laughs> and I, I can't remember exactly how we, how we got to this point, but they let me test drive the fucking Ferrari. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. Wow. <laughs> there, was nothing, there was no receipts. I didn't have to show him my bank account. I, I, I just, you know, I, I, present, I tried presenting myself in a, in a confident way and, and looking, you know, tried to act like I belonged. And so I, I test drove the Ferrari around and, you know, I ended up, I really enjoyed it. I brought it back. And when I brought it back, we were, I was discussing some numbers with the guy. And then this uh, nice young woman, the account, the, the Ferrari accountant came into there. And we started breaking down numbers and how much it would cost me to get it back to the United States. And I told the guy, the, the salesman, you know, I'll consider this, but you got to get me, you got to get me her number. I got to go on a date with her. The account. <laughs> so he goes and talks to her. She says, all right, cool. So she gives me her number and I see her before I go again. And we go on a date a couple of days later and I'm like, hey, do you think I should buy that car? She's uh, is she going to hear this story? <laughs> oh, Probably not. No, there's no yeah, females fuck, at work. Whatever. Who yeah. cares? So I, uh, so yeah, so she's like, uh, you probably shouldn't, you know, I just, you know, probably find a better deal at some point in time. I'm like, all right, cool. And then me and her started dating for about three or four months until I left Vancouver and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You were no longer dating after that. Nice. Uh, that's, so the Ferrari almost happened, but, uh, God, I wish I would have done, I mean, you know what? I knew at some point in time I was going to have some sort of life moment where I, where I spewed most of that money away. I should have just bought the Ferrari. <laughs> I knew it at the, time. at the time. I said to myself, "I should just buy it. if I, I can resell it in one year. I'm not going to lose much money. Like it's yeah. it'll just be a very great experience for me to do." But I didn't, and that's the that's my uh, I'm going to do that before. The interesting dance there, probably with the salesman, would have been where how you get the test drive. Like you know, you don't want to come out and say, "Hey, can I test drive a Ferrari?" You got to kind of it's it's a and you're a poker player, so you know exactly what you're doing with the guy, and I'm sure he's probably had. Some people walk in off the street, just bum rush them and say, hey, give me the keys. Yeah, I can't exactly remember how that, how that was possibly could have happened. <laughs> I think it was just like, um, you know, I'm really interested in getting a Ferrari, you know, I've been, I got, but I'd like to drive it first. I'm not just going to buy one and not drive it. I want to experience it for myself. I want to I wanna feel it, and then I want to convince myself in my mind to get it. And maybe it was a slow week. I'm not sure. He said, but he said... Yeah, said, let's go. The funny part is, but the Ferrari dealership in Vancouver is is located in a sort of a busy area of town. So you go like stoplight to stoplight. There's no yeah, real we, place to go and open the thing up at all. Yeah, it was kind of we just kind of took it uh, like took it right into downtown. And yeah, I, on Pacific over there, you can kind of oh yeah, like a, a little stretch of the road where you can kind of a little bit open it up. But not yeah, for the most part, it was kind of just. <laughs> It's kind of just enjoying the enjoying this. Pacific little. Boulevard used to be where uh, we used to run the indie races back when we had indie races in yeah. Vancouver. Now so now there's yeah. a light right. every 15 yards on, on that street, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> by the way, did you know there's a, a rapper named Joey Chicago? Or no, a DJ. Sorry, he's a DJ. No way. Yeah, Joey Chicago, he's like a big famous DJ. Well, right? while introing you on the show, Adam, in the first segment, probably said Joey Chicago about three times. I said it like three <laughs> times because for some reason I read his name today when I was researching a little bit about uh, uh, bringing you on the show that, uh, and I ran into this 
Joey Chicago DJ, guy a few times. DJ but, Joey Chicago. Yeah, you guys. You guys you <laughs> I don't know how famous he really is, though. Yeah, this yeah, Joey yeah. Chicago. He's not near as famous as uh, this. This no, not nearly as legendary. He's probably never been in a Ferrari other than the passenger seat. Right, right. <laughs> Joey, thanks so much. I appreciate the uh, the time. Uh, and uh, if you get down to the uh, Bahamas for uh, for the the big festival down there, hope uh, hope you run good. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, guys. Thanks for having me on. Good luck with your good luck. How's the? Uh, can I ask any questions? How's sure. the three man? How's the three man? You guys doing a three man booth now? No, uh, we well we do a little bit. I mean, it's uh, we have a producer Ross who's who's here. Is that what you're talking about? The the show here local? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Mike moved on. He uh, he went back to uh, doing his thing at uh, at the eye clinic that he's been uh, working with for so long. He, he I guess the show uh, got in the way a little bit. He's got two young daughters, so it's time to uh, time to move on. So uh, instead of uh, packing the whole thing in, uh, I, uh, I I talked to Terrence and he was willing to come on board. And we got a new producer here, Ross. So uh, it's going well. Yeah, we're we're having some fun for sure. Is what happened? Is Terrence still doing? Are you still doing your podcast? I really liked uh, Terrence came up with the, you know, he, he's going to have these old school guys on that kind of been out of limelight for a while. And that was kind of an idea I was thinking about that would yeah. be really cool if someone was to do that. Are you still doing that, Terrence? Um, well, first of all, thanks so much for the compliment. I, I appreciate that. I haven't done it for a while just because uh, I've been doing this this thing. And uh, I, I figured the the public can only stand me listening to me talking to their ear jabbering in their ear so many hours of a week but i i would like i still do have a very long list of like you said old school guys who uh who crushed it back in the days and have moved on to other things um and and uh i i haven't made any headway on that but i would like to start doing that so comments like that always are, are going to incentivize me a little towards doing that a little so maybe i'll uh get my ass in shape a little bit and start and start working on that a little but uh thanks very much i'm glad you uh, enjoyed listening to the life after poker podcasts yeah, I, when I first saw you, you t- tweeted the idea out. I was like, yeah, that's a perfect idea because I was thinking about doing something, but I was still in PLO guest, but I don't think I'd be the best at interviewing like past guys who don't play poker at all and moved on. And then I saw you do it. I was like, oh, that, that's like perfect. So, you know, hopefully you'll get, we can catch up with some more I'll work on it. legends. <laughs> Promise <laughs> yeah, I'll work on it. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And feel free to refer any if you come across any. Say uh, you'd be a perfect guest for Terrence. So he's probably looking for suggestions. Yeah, I don't think I really run into the the the, the old school guys. That was kind of those guys. He's were not as after. old, Adam. Yes, that's right. I, I forget. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, I'm old, but I'm not. I'm not as like when when those guys were all like crushing. I was playing ten cent twenty five cent and playing <laughs> all in a day, so I wasn't really like. Uh, yeah, I wasn't really in the scene or, or met most of those people, so I've kind of yeah, it was a bit before me. Fantastic stuff, thanks, Joey. Appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll talk to you soon, and good luck. All right, guys, have fun, man. Good luck. I'll see you guys. Well, thank yeah. you. So, Terrence, last week we were talking about things that uh, we don't want to be a thing anymore, and one of them, or one of mine, was uh, poker awards shows with uh, with sort of uh, uh, nebulous uh, awards, you know, breakout player of the year, that yeah. kind of thing that we couldn't quantify. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've been criticized for uh, for not bringing on opposing views, so I thought, why not bring in the uh, the head cheese over at the American Poker Awards at the GPI? He, this man has uh, a million things on his plate. Uh, he's going to come talk to us today about uh, uh, about some of them. Uh, Alex Dreyfus, Alex, welcome to the PokerCast. Thank you very much, guys, for uh, the welcome and for the invitation. Uh, no, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, as I was mentioning off the top, I want to jump right into the uh, the American Poker Awards, which is uh, is one of your projects that uh, is going to happen this year. Um, uh, give, give us an idea of what of what the goal was um, with the awards and why you think this is uh, something that uh, needs to happen here in 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 2015. Sure. First of all, um, the European Poker Awards used to exist since uh, 13 years, uh, mainly in Paris or sometimes in London as well. So there was a European facing awards that aim to reward the best players, of course, but the industry stakeholders, the best poker media, the best poker tournament or the poker room, blah, blah, blah. So this is something that exists in Europe. And when I acquired the GPI uh, two years and a half ago, my so-called vision or plan was actually to help poker to be seen differently and to help poker to become an industry. I actually like to say that poker is an old game, but a young industry. And to help 
poker to be more um, aggregated, to be more legit, uh, even in the in the newspaper, to avoid to only have uh, articles about uh, cheating, borgata, uh, full tilt, and all this stuff. We need to help this industry to become an industry, and and, and to make this happen. I believe, I personally believe, that uh, we need to have an awards ceremony which become a, a rendezvous, a rendezvous in French, uh, a, a yearly, uh, a yearly uh, event where the industry is gathered together uh, and is rewarding the best initiative. And we can talk about what is best, of course, but rewarding the best initiative and celebrating uh its own game and its own industry because today there is no event in the world unfortunately where the industry you me we can meet which is not a poker tournament and when there is a poker tournament nobody is uh, is available so I, I wanted to do that and so we, we we made a day it's the 27th of february at the sls hotel in los angeles we have it's it's a two-fold event there is the awards ceremony during the evening, but during the day, we have as well a poker conference, like a poker summit, where um, 100, 150 people from the industry are coming to talk about the future of poker. And that's the whole point and the whole goal of, the, of this project. Now, Alex, uh, you know you're, you're definitely. I can understand your your point of view that that there, uh, why you why you would think there would be need to be an American Poker Awards because uh, you know myself, I, I'm somebody who's North American based for a long time. You know, I only had a very vague idea there was there was a European Poker Awards. Uh, you know, as an official actual a, a, a show. You know, something where people yeah. put on a suit and jacket and uh, and come up and accept a trophy and that kind of thing. And it seems to be what you're you're trying to uh, do here in, in Los Angeles. I looked at some of the pictures that you have on your site, and it looks like a very uh, fancy and a nice affair. Is it something that you you want? To, you know, you think something that that you're just it's an investment in the future, or is this something that you can think and be? You know, you're a businessman. Is it going to be profitable in itself just to to run the show, or is it just part of kind of uh, increasing poker's uh, you know you know vision? You know, extending your vision of poker. Uh, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, the, the reality, I mean, I indeed, it, first of all, in Europe, um, it exists, it works, it's legit. It's not like famous uh, everywhere in the newspaper, but getting there step by step, year after year. Actually, the European version, uh, we bought it last year. So it, it was existing before us, but we took it over to put it under the umbrella of GPI. Um, in terms of why and if there is a profitability, the answer is no, there is no profitability, but <laughs> never, ne never there is with GPI and the project we are running right now. To, to be totally transparent, and I'm actually saying that publicly, and I've said it in the, in the past, uh, GPI right now, it's two years and a half. It's almost $4 million invested from my own money. Uh, I'm the only investor, as I own 100%. And I'm trying to build a company that's going to become the UFC, the NASCAR, the Formula One, the, 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 the marketing company of poker. And I believe that the award is part of this big puzzle, this big uh, piece. So it's a small piece of the big picture, but it's a piece that needs to be there. Um, do I expect everybody to come with a suit or tuxedo? The answer is no. You're a poker player, guys. It's never going to happen. <laughs> um, but we, we try to... Um, and it's going to be the first time in U.S., so I don't know what is the, um, uh, let's say, uh, dressing code uh, in U.S. for that kind of event. But we're definitely going to try to make it clean and to avoid what we had last year again. Uh, people coming on stage with a T-shirt. Uh, that's something I'm going to try to avoid because <laughs> I, I, at the end, you know... Um, I'm going to say something horrible and I'm probably going to be insulted on the forum uh, after that. But the, the biggest problem of poker is actually players sometimes. And we, we, we need to, I'm, I'm going to say, educate, share, talk about how we can all together promote poker differently and, and change the image and disrupt the image of poker, and for that we need the support of the players. So I'm talking a lot to the guys. Uh, we, we have this uh, Global Poker Masters, the World Cup of Poker, end of March, for example, in Europe, and I'm myself talking to every single player to be sure that they're going to come and that we agree on the format and all this stuff. So there, there is a communication channel uh, between, uh, between us to make it right, let's say. 
Uh, one of the challenges with uh, award shows is how you go about uh, picking the people who win the awards. And I, I think to the uh, Hall of Fame, I've always had sort of a trouble with the, the Poker Hall of Fame, given that it's, dis- it's yes, people suggest by uh, writing in who they want to be uh, considered for, uh, uh, for entry into the Hall of Fame, but ultimately it's picked by people who uh, we don't know, and we don't know their criteria, really, et cetera. So, so uh, how, can maybe explain to us how you go about figuring out who's winning the American Poker Awards? Yes. Uh, first of all, there is thir- uh, 14, let me check. There is 14 awards. It's not just one or two people. Uh, there is different type of award. They are available on the website. Yeah, there is actually as well a, a nice uh, image that explain everything. And I'm gonna watch it to be sure. I'm not seeing. Oh, actually, I don't find it. Uh, ah, yes, here. Um, in Europe, we, we actually do the exact same thing that we do in Europe since 13 years. So there is first for nine awards, which is the rising uh, rising star, tournament performance, event of the year, industry person of the year, media person, charitable initiative, blah, blah, blah. We have nine uh, awards and there is a nomination panel. We sent actually an email to 130 people uh, two days ago uh, where they have to fill up and 130 Americans actually, I mean, North American, uh, who has to fill up their choice for these nine awards, or a little bit more. Then, based on, and and that's going to end up uh, till the 1st of February. Uh, Then the 1st of February, we take these votes, and we take the top four of every single category. And this top four is going to be the nominees uh, for the awards. And the day of the event, there will be a jury of eight people that will, non-publicly, of course, but that will uh, vote out of the four nominees who's going to win. So we make it very, and and by the way, the people that vote doesn't know uh, what the others are voting. They will discover it as well during the ceremony. So out of the 14, uh, 14, of, uh, yeah, 14 awards, more than nine of them are uh, v- uh, voted, let's say, by industry stakeholders. Uh, and then we have three awards that comes from the ranking, so the GPI Poker sure. Player of the Year, the Female and the Challenger Cup. And we have one People Choice Award, which is this year for the Poker Best Ambassador. Why we don't want to use too much the People's Choice Award, especially in poker? Because I believe that um, people doesn't know. I mean, it's it's a bit arrogant. Um, Not arrogant, but uh, if I if every year I'm asking you who is the best poker player from the from a forum, for example, I will always get uh, Phil Ivey, Daniel Negreanu, and always the, the 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 biggest names, and not necessarily the best names. Why? Because internet is made like that, and you you, you cannot control the fact that people is not going to spend the time that they need to spend to to really judge and uh, uh, find the accurate information. So we, we don't want to be a contest about who has the largest Twitter account and can then influence the winner. We want the real stakeholder to decide based on really what they think. Interesting. Uh, uh, the other thing I, I would ask you about about the awards and how they're they're picked is uh, there's probably going to be you know there's going to be a lot of nominations and if all of them showed up I'd be pretty surprised given that you know they're around the world or somebody's over in at a tournament or something you know where they have a conflict maybe they don't come to the to the event and they and then if you turn around and the person that wins the ter- wins the award isn't at the event it's it's not much fun is it. It's not much fun, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, let's say that um, well, obviously we, we, we don't know before uh, who's going to win and uh, we make it clear that way uh, because I believe that's what is more relevant and more legit. Uh, we, we, uh, the, this event has been planned in purpose to be not in Las Vegas, uh, but in LA, which is the uh, uh, 
capital of the awards. So, uh, of course, I, I wanted to use this platform to promote poker outside of a casino as well. So that's why we decided not to make it at Commerce or Bike or whatever, but to make it in Beverly Hills in a nice hotel to allow me to manage to get to get uh, media, uh, local media mainly, uh, to come over and cover it as a proper award ceremony. It's it's gonna be an intimate event. It's 200, 250 people. We don't want more, and we cannot handle more. But th that's one thing. Back to the people uh, that's gonna be here or not here. It's the day before the main event of the World Poker Tour LAPC, and we agreed with Commerce. To not and they agreed to not have any event in the front of our awards because the idea was they want it to be successful because it's good for them, it's good for poker, it's good for everybody. So there is no other significant tournament either in LA, either in US that day. Uh, so we aim to get most of the big and famous players uh, on board. That's a that's a good strategy, Alex. I wanted to ask you again about uh, what you said just a few moments ago about, you know, a lot of times uh, it's hard for the public to decide who, you know, the best poker player, the best breakthrough player, best female player, best whatever player is because uh, they don't necessarily follow it enough or they haven't done the research. I, I agree with you on that. The problem is I always think my problem with this is there are very few people who are actually qualified to judge who are the best poker players. I mean, if you think about uh, who, who the very who, who, my opinion, who, who, in my opinion, would know who the very best no limit hold'em players in the world are? It's probably just the other of the very best no limit hold'em players in the world. You know, you, you, you have a very select group. Uh, you know, people, people like like media and and your average players, they might have a, a an understanding of who seems to win a lot. But but in truth, it, it's very hard to assess unless you are actually at the skill level yourself of 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 that. Of of that high caliber player, you know, a lot of a lot of people ask me who who the best like uh, limit hold'em player is is around back in my day when I was one of the best. But if you would ask me who is the the best uh, seven card stud player, I wouldn't know because I'm not a seven card stud expert. So how do you sort of recognize, uh, you know, the the problem that I think Adam brings up, which is it it seems kind of arbitrary to say like this guy is the best player this year. So uh, it's gonna actually the answer is gonna be very easy. Let me just send that okay. on Skype at the same time. Oh. Um, as I said, there is two kind of awards. There is the best poker players, the best poker player, let's say, and that one is actually based on the GPI ranking. We already uh, know who it is uh, because there is no discussion. The numbers are right, and we 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 uh, let's say claim that the best poker player or the best American poker player in 2014 is the GPI uh, player of the year and of the topic. Back to the other awards, uh, they are much more uh, easy or easier to discuss because they are rising star of the year, tournament performance of the year. The, the, that's the only two other awards that are player centric and they are of course, subject to a lot of discussion. And you, I think we cannot agree that the Oscars give me the best movie of the year as well. Sure. It's, a matter, it's a matter of taste. Uh, and in, in, in any award, we can agree or disagree. For me, that's not the right question. The question is, does it serve a higher purpose to promote poker, to promote the players, and to promote the game? Uh, and that's why we really split in two. The pure... Uh, player um, awards are mainly based on the GPI ranking because then there is no discussion. We can disagree on the fact that it's accurate or not, but at least the math and the number says it's that guy and that's it. Mm. The, the, the other one, the rising star of the year, the tournament performance of the year, uh, they are players. Subjective. subjective yeah, right. they, they are subjective where, okay, I believe that the best performance was David Ikita. I don't know. Uh, uh, sure, actually, sure. It's not American, but yeah. Yeah. So that's the way we see it. 
Uh, it's interesting. Um, so I want to I want to move on to some other stuff, Alex. Uh, I want to talk about uh, your opinion that uh, poker needs to be sportified, and uh, I wonder uh, what what uh, your your definition of that is. If you um, if you believe poker is a sport and should be treated as such, or if it's more of sort of an adjective to um, fall into sort of your big your big your vision for the game rather than poker is a sport type argument. Um, it's a bit of both, but um, f- first of all, I do not believe that poker will be recognized ever as a sport. There is few countries, Brazil, even China, sometimes Russia. There is some, let's say, advanced country that um, has poker federation that are recognized by sports authority. That's great, but that's not my fight, never my battle. My v- sort of vision or view or strategy is to promote poker as a sport, not to make poker a sport. So I want to promote poker as a sport. Why? Because it's the only way right now we can believe we can reignite a boost, not a boom, but a boost of poker in the next few years because poker needs innovation. Poker needs uh, novelties. We cannot expect poker to grow again if we do the same shit kind of or excuse my french um, the same shit since since we, since we do uh, since uh, 10 years uh, i mean we, we we do the same uh, tv content we do the same events we do the same stuff always the same place that's not how you you um you you reignite something i mean in any industry in the world i'm not talking about gaming i'm not talking about internet i'm not talking about poker Every single indus cycle uh, sorry every single every single industry has a cycle, and every ten years, every fifteen years, you need uh, a disruption and uh, the, the poker we live today uh, used to exist since now twelve, fourteen years more or less, and it does need fresh blood, fresh ideas, fresh money, and the only way I see that coming is with a different way of selling it. And indeed, GPI is trying, we, we actually uh, have this trademark and this name, We Spotify Poker, because that's the way I believe we can uh, talk to um, sports website, mainstream portal, to talk about poker. And that's why we launched the World Cup, and that's why we launched what we announced a few weeks ago, the Global Poker League, GPL, and uh, which is another baby that I would love to talk about. Please, yeah. Please do tell us about it. Uh, okay. it's the, is it the Global Poker Masters? Uh, so there is two uh, two babies. Uh, one is the Global Poker Masters, which is uh, uh, as well the World Cup of Poker. Uh, so it's more like the Ryder Cup in golf or the Davis Cup in tennis. Um, it's the eight best GPI countries uh, with the top five players uh, of these countries fighting against each other for two days. So you're going to have uh, US, UK, Canada, Germany, Russia, France, Italy, and Ukraine. And these players, the top players, uh, they're going to compete for two days on a live stream with no delay, which will allow people to do live bet as well online. Um, and they will compete with a different format uh, to, to define uh, who is the best country. So the idea is they don't play for the money. And believe me, that's the hardest part to convince the best player in the world to do not play for money, but to play for their country, to play for the the future of the game. And because they do believe that there is an interest to create a legitimate World Cup of Poker or Poker's World Cup uh, that will help media to say, oh, USA won the World Cup of Poker and not anymore. Um, Dan Smith won $800,000 in a WPT in California. Uh, so we, that, that's our first baby. But the second one is much more uh, ambitious, much more dangerous, much more difficult. It's the Global Poker League, GPL, so the NFL and NBA, NHL of poker, which is the first professional poker league, team-based, and it's the same. We're going to have, it's going to be hopefully launched before this summer, and it's going to be six franchises owned by individuals that cannot play in the, in the league or in the team. So let's say Dan Shack, just to take an example, could become 
one of them, but he will not be able to compete in the league. He will not play. He will own the Shackers, for example. And that team, that uh, franchise, is going to compete against uh, five other teams during a series of six events that will be during three or four months. We haven't decided totally. It's going to be live stream as well. And the idea is really to Spotify poker by having uh, po uh, sports media to talk about this league before, during, and after the events. We're going to have a draft uh, part as well. Uh, you're gonna ha you, if you're a team owner, you need to take at least out of the five players, three players that are on the top 300 of GPI, uh, but you cannot have more than one that is in the top 10, for example. So there is a lot of rules and fun we're going to add into that. And the idea, again, is to build a series of events that's going to help poker and help players to be seen differently, to be more legit, and most important, the, the, the main issue that we have with poker is recognition of players. Why? Because every single final table, there is more than half of it that are random players. And that's great for poker because it means that me, as a random player, I can achieve that. That's great. But for the recognition of a game as a sport and for having media to talk regularly about the same players, we need to set up a platform to set up a tool that allows them to always be talked about. And that's the league. You don't think that the, the media talking about a story about a, a, a random player winning, you know, a, an unknown player winning a million dollars in a poker tournament, you don't think that's valuable? You, you think it's more valuable to have a known player win that tournament? No, I say that we need both. We need to have the uh, random player because it makes sense, because it gives me the aspiration, aspirational uh, aspect of poker, meaning that you and me, we can win. So that's needed and that's very important. Uh, but I believe we need as well a new layer to get more regular coverage of sports media website where there is like thousands of millions of people reading it every single day. Uh, because today, let's be realistic, nobody gives a shit about any single poker event in US except the World Series and barely the World Series, only the main event. So how can we change that? How can we expose poker differently? I believe it's through uh, the, the sports formatted poker. Do you think uh, ESPN does a good job uh, and uh, 419 Productions with, with the television aspect of the World Series of Poker? You, you mentioned something about the same tournaments, the same format, etc. Um, what, what do you think could be did, done differently there? Uh, I, I wish to know. Uh, that's the reality. I, I think they do a great job. I think ESPN, Mori, and, uh, and of course, Ty and all the guys, they do a great job. Uh, they are the one who gave the initial boost uh, and actually the initial boom of poker in the world. Uh, so uh, I'm very grateful and we should all be grateful. But the format, I mean, I, I like to say that, as I told you at the beginning, poker is an old game but a young industry. But it's not even an industry because every single poker initiative serves the interest of the initiator, meaning that the whole series of poker uh, interest is to bring people to Caesars Casino to make money out of it. And that's fair. That's their business. The WPT business model is to drive people to the casino where there is the WPT license. And the EPT business model is actually to promote the brand of poker stars. And every single initiative has conflict of interest and different uh, needs. So I believe there is a need of a neutral, agnostic, uh, independent vehicle poker marketing company to promote poker as a new layer, which doesn't compete with the existing ecosystem. We do not compete and we will never with WSOP, WPT, EPT, Borgata Open, whatever, because we work with them. We own the Hand and Mob, we own GPI, we do the awards for them. So we, we are totally new, but we believe, I believe, that we have to bring something new as well, a new layer, uh, to promote it differently. And the only way to promote it differently is we need to build it differently. So it cannot be what exists today. Um, so you, your point that the, the industry is ready for some of these changes, um, uh, I'm interested to think to hear if you think that 
the people in the industry uh, itself are are ready for the changes or want the changes. I mean, uh, uh, you know, convincing poker players not to wear pajamas to the final table might be a little bit harder than that's a, obviously an extreme example. But you know, what I'm saying, like, is there is there enough initiative within the people in the industry to to uh, you know reach some of these goals that you have? Uh, that's my biggest challenge. Um, so. There is many answer to that. To, to that, uh, right now, you, how can I say that? You know, I like to say that you create a. I mean, I would like to make a perception a reality, and not the other way around. Meaning that the more guys like me believe, maybe being naive, and yes, I am naive. I'm crazy, naive, stupid, and arrogant. But that's the only way that you make you can make things moving. If there is no leaders whatever it means, that spend their own energy and hopefully maybe their own money to make it work, it will just never work because then you just go by the river and by the flow and you just listen and you just become a, a ship. I mean, uh, I don't know how you say it in English, but you, you just follow the, yeah, follow the river. Um, in my personal case, I spent, I'm in the poker space since 10 years. I was the, uh, the founder of Winamax, the, the, the French successful poker room. I sold it in 2006. Then I created a chilipoker.com that I sold two years and a half ago to uh, to Bali Technology in Las Vegas, and 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 that first eight years helped me to understand the other side of the poker industry and to give me a name to the industry stakeholders. Now during the last three years, I'm more on the player part. Uh, I'm literally prostituting myself, going on every single poker tournament to promote GPI, to promote our initiative, um, and. Do I like it? Sometimes yes, sometimes not. But I do think it's needed. And I, I can tell you that, for example, let's take Phil Helmut. Uh, I had a public uh, fight with Phil Helmut about the GPI ranking, actually, like six or eight months ago. Like, we literally like scream against each other. Uh, he never really understood what was GPI as a ranking, first of all, and what was the big picture uh, of what I'm trying to do. In December of this year, like the last month, I was in San Francisco. I sent him an email. I said, hey, man, I want to meet you. I would like to spend two hours and explain to you what I'm trying to do. And at the end of the meeting, it was, wow, okay, now it makes sense. Now I understand. I love 96% of what you are doing. I don't care about the other 4%. And I will do what I can to promote what you do because it makes sense for me as Phil Elmut. It makes sense for me as a player. And I believe it makes sense as a poker, as a poker industry. And right now, I do have the support of Helmut, Ivy, Negreanu, Jacobs, Jacobson, uh, all, all the top poker players in the world, most of them, they understand what we do and they are becoming supporter. And the poker industry as well, uh, we, we have a big problem in our industry. We have uh, Poker Stars, which is our biggest sponsor, by the way, our biggest customer. But the problem is they own 70% of the online poker market in the world. So there is no more competition. There is no more traction. And so the innovation and the money is much more difficult to get. So I had to spend the last two years to convince stars to support what we do. Why? Because whatever is we do that will potentially be good for poker is statistically good for poker stars. So it's in their interest to help us to be successful to Spotify poker. And if you look at what they announced the last few weeks, few months, they are actually starting to use our brand, a trademark uh, to Spotify poker. They use GPI for the EPT, PCA, um, APPT, all their live events. They embed the fantasy poker game in the EPT website as well. And they are helping us to make this World Cup and all this stuff. So there is an understanding of the industry. Not everybody yet. Uh, WPT is using GPI ranking as well for their own player of the year. The only one that doesn't yet is WSOP, but I haven't given up. Uh, and, and, and I'm dedicating myself, and my wife hates me for that, but I'm dedicating myself to try to convince uh, all forces in poker to go in the same direction. Well, your passion for the game and passion for the industry, Alex, is clear. Uh, thank you so much for coming on our show and explaining uh, uh, why you think uh, all these things need to be done. Really appreciate your time. Uh, hope to hear from you again soon. 
I hope you will come to the American Poker Awards, Adam. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, well, I'll talk to my wife and see if I can uh, uh, sneak away. But uh, thanks again so much. Uh, really appreciate your time, Alex. Thank you, guys. Thanks. That was Alex Dreyfus, uh, owner of the GPI. He, he's and passionate about his job. He, a little he bit. is. He's fired up. And you know what? That's a good thing, really. I mean, he, you know, you can talk about or disagree with some of the things that he thinks or agrees with, whatever, but you can't argue the guy's passion. I mean, he's. Yeah, he's, and the fact that he's willing to put his own uh, money into this kind of thing. I a mean, lot it, of money, it, too. It, it makes, yeah, it, it makes me. You know, sort of feel bad about the, Me too. the, the shitting on poker show, uh, award shows. So it's a good thing that we got him in. And, uh, you know, in the end, it doesn't seem like he, he's got like an all ulterior motive on this. He seems to, to really want to promote the game. So that can only uh, that can only be good things uh, for the poker world if he's successful. I still think, uh, you know, I'm still very skeptical. Uh, a lot of these concepts, you know, the World Cup of Poker has been tried in, in so many different formats. It, it's it is a little. Uh, hard to see how how to make it work and whether it can get the traction that a lot of these uh you know like a hundred k super high roller can get. But um, he seems really really committed to making that work. I'm intrigued by the poker league. Like, wouldn't it be fun to have a franchise and uh, and playoffs <laughs> and have like a Stanley Cup of poker or something? Or, yeah, it'd you know, be play- a bunch of people betting daily on on daily fantasy based yeah. on the on their poker every day. So yeah, yeah. I just checked my GPI rank. I, I am I am. Uh, all the way at 2266th place on, on the GPI while I was doing that. Nice. So, uh, yeah, how's your GPI ranking oh, looking my, these days? I haven't played a tournament in forever, so I can't be uh, uh, can't There be are too numbers high, high enough? Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, I, well, it's based on tournaments. I'm not really a, yeah. a high-volume tournament guy. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I really kind of enjoyed that interview. And like you said, I kind of feel a little bit bad now. I th- You know, the, the poker awards really aren't for you or I or – Frankly, most right. of the people that listen to the show, it's it's to, uh, it seems like from what he's talking about, it's to uh, legitimize uh, the game in the eyes of the non-poker players, media and else otherwise. And, uh, and you know, if, if that's the case, then, uh, then maybe it is a good thing. I don't know. I guess it's not really too much different from, you know, award shows and movies or music or whatever. It, it, it like, like Alex yeah. points out, it's not really about who the quote unquote best is. It's about this sort of this uh, media about media kind of, uh, of circus that, that surrounds these types of things and uh, just getting exposure for it. However well, it's, you can. To, it's to sell movie tickets, right? I mean, that's what the yeah. Oscars is about. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, this is about um, selling the game of poker. So, uh, so I can, I'm gonna th- think on it a bit, but uh, I'm coming around a little bit to this. I, I, the category still sort of bother me to some degree with, you know, breakout player of the year, whatever that kind of thing. But uh, and, and, right. how, and, and how they pick that person again. I mean, you know, and that, let's face it, that the person, the breakout player of the year, uh, now has something that he can go shop himself to. To, so it's good for players. I mean, that, that guy can go shop himself to poker sites or other other advertising vehicles for him to uh, to, to sign on to and make make some extra money with. Right, it's a marketing it's it's a marketing thing all the way for sure. And uh, you know, speaking about the selection process, Alex, uh, we did that interview on Skype, and he skyped us the the link to the selection and who who's kind of involved in the selection and all that. So we'll make sure we throw that up there in the show thread so people can see. Uh, their selection process. Yeah, indeed. I, I hope that they don't, you know, the, he said they pick the winners the day of, and I hope the fact that if, you know, the person's going to be there or not doesn't really enter into if they're going to win it. But again, it's it's a, sort of as nebulous. Uh, a lot of them are, are kind of nebulous anyway. So yeah. who knows? But uh, interesting nonetheless, uh, we have a strategy minute from uh, CrushLivePoker.com, of course, uh, Bart Hansen's uh, fantastic tr- live poker training site. Um, new sponsor for the poker cast uh, this week Bart's talking about gaining information post flop uh, have a listen to the strategy minute and we are coming back with uh, uh, an interview with uh, our old friend Steve Day from the Isle of Man who's going to talk about some of the uh, recent happenings or in the big recent happening over poker stars um, we'll uh, we'll unveil that uh, after the break um, you're listening to the two plus two poker cast more right after this Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Poker Strategy Minute brought to you by CrushLivePoker.com. I am Bart Hansen, and today I want to talk to you about hand reading based upon the pre-flop raiser's action post-flop. There's a natural order of things when it comes to No Limit Hold'em, and usually 
people will check to the preflop raiser. So if you picture a scenario where the preflop raiser is last to act in position and everyone checks to him and he checks back after the flop, you don't actually have any information about the other player's strengths of their hand that are also in there as well. However, if their preflop raiser is, say, under the gun, and he's first to act post-flop, and he checks, and then let's say two or three people check behind him, then those people behind him really aren't going to be all that strong. We actually have gained information because they've checked. In the first scenario, we don't gain anything because they're basically going to check all the time. So in scenario two, if we're in the blinds and the preflop raiser checks under the gun and people check behind him, we can really stab at the pot on a lot of turns, especially when the board doesn't really change. Hey, poker fans, don't forget about the 2plus2.com digital magazine. Each month, a wide array of poker professionals and media write fascinating articles about the game you love. Want to learn about big blind versus small blind hand ranges? How about optimal Jeopardy daily double strategy? Topics like those and many others are covered every month. Head on over to 2plus2.com to see what the magazine has to offer this month. Playing 50 big blinds deep with Annie's, the villain in the hand opens to 2.2x from the cutoff, and I defend my big blind with ace free offsuit. The flop comes ace 6 9 with two clubs, and I check call a free big blind C bet. The turn is a free, bringing a second flush draw and giving me two pairs. And once again, I check call, this time for five big blinds. The river is a six of clubs, completing the flush and counterfeiting me as well. I check, and he bats 11 big blinds. As it's close to the worst possible hand I can have at this point, and I have full house blockers, I turn it into a bluff and check raise all in. Team Pro Online's Mickey Mement Mori Peterson is a supernova VIP. This is the 2 Plus 2 PokerCast, presented by the PokerStars VIP Club. Okay, people. Most of the kittens have perished. There are a few left you can save, though, and here's how to do it. Get involved with the PokerCast by emailing your questions, suggestions for the show, or even record a sound clip. Adam will be using the best ones on the air. Well, let's face it, probably the worst ones as well. I can see you there at your computer. Send an email right now. Totally disagree with one of Adam's takes last week? Send an email. Love last week's interview? Email. Want to know how much cash Adam has on him right now? Email. PokerCast at 2plus2.com is the address. Ship the funny to Adam today. Hi, I'm Bart Hansen, the owner and operator of CrushLivePoker.com. I wanted to tell all you PokerCast listeners about some of the free material we've put on our website. You can listen to me every Sunday at 4.45 Pacific Time for Crush Live Collins, a call-in show analyzing hands in real time. And of course, you can also check out 2 Plus 2 legend Lyman as he does his show on Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Be sure to also take a look at our strategy forums, free to read and post for everyone. Presented by the Poker Stars VIP Club, uh, Terrence. What did you think of that interview with uh, with Joey? He's uh, his, he's his, a legend. I yeah. mean, the, the, the story about the Ferrari. You thought it couldn't get any better than this uh, Ferrari, <laughs> but he gets a he gets a date with the account manager. It's all it was a great great story. The guy can craft a yarn for sure. Yeah, if you want to check out his podcast, head over to YouTube. Uh, search. Uh, Chicago Joey uh, Poker Podcast, or I guess Poker, uh, Chicago Joey Poker will do it. You'll find it's it. Joe Ingram YouTube. 1. Joe Ingram 1, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he puts them all up on YouTube, which I forgot to ask him about that, actually. Uh, disseminating the podcast, how he goes about it. I don't think he has it on iTunes, or at least I haven't seen it. Uh, there's a few episodes. He mostly just does it alive with like Google Hangout, and it just right. records, and then it uploads. And then he's got own. it on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, interesting way to do it, I think. His production is good. I, 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 uh, I think he does a good job with it. But uh, anyway, check that out if you want to uh, take in some more poker content. A lot of high-stakes PLO talk. Uh, and him talking shit about people generally. <laughs> some, there's there's some of that in there anyway. Not uh, so much for the some new good year, stuff. Apparently. Yeah, we uh, we touched we touched on it earlier. The the PCA is well underway down in uh, Paradise Island at the Bahamas. In the Bahamas, um, we're not down there. We wish we were. We wish we weren't. Uh, but mostly, we wish we were there with our see our friends. Uh, the the venue isn't uh, so important, but it's always such a great uh, well. Uh, gathering the the place. way I always put it is the PCA. Is is the best poker event there is? I just wish it were somewhere else. Well, that's that, the problem. That's the there is nowhere yeah. else where they could do it, I, I know. and that is the problem. They can't do it on the United States anywhere because obviously that would be a bunch of legal issues, and it's really hard to find a, a casino or a conference center or anything of that size that support infrastructure that's close to the United States. Well, it, yeah, that size is the key there. Uh, I don't. It's outgrowing the ability to really go anywhere else. I think at this point, it right. seems like yeah, which. Which uh, is is interesting. It's you know we, we, it's not the worst place in the world. It's not, it's certainly uh, worthwhile to go once, as you said. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the hundred k high roller, super high roller, sorry, is in the books. Sixty six entries, uh, thirteen re entries. Uh, Bill Perkins uh, fired three bullets. Dan Shack uh, a <laughs> couple. Uh, your winner is uh, Mr. Tim Com, Steve O'Dwyer, who. I believe just came off recently winning the high roller in Macau, in Macau yeah, when we, we were there. We were there for that one. Uh, he so it's a second uh, big high roller win, and super high roller win in a couple of months. So not not too bad for yeah. He, yeah, he uh, he takes down one point nine million in the Bahamas for it. Um, if you remember his, he had sort of a frank interview with Remco after the tournament in Macau. Where he was, you know, you, you'd think a guy who won a high roller would be pretty pumped up. I think he's a level guy to begin with. He doesn't get too excited or too down, For sure. it seems. But um, he uh, he's, you know, pretty frank about the fact that, look, uh, it's not a big secret that people who grind and play these things generally a lot of the times have small pieces. So, uh, you know, it's not like I took home this big prize. But, uh, you know, he was happy with uh, how he played. And he talked a lot about uh, not, not so much the the result but uh, the decisions that he made along the way which which you know he's pretty level-headed hopefully you know maybe he, a couple in a row he, he might get a little more excited yeah well i think the second time i usually after you hit a big score you know if uh, you know you you get to have a big better piece of yourself because you know if you're in makeup you get yourself out of the makeup and uh you know you may be a little more confident to take a larger piece of yourself because the the buy-in is a smaller percentage of your overall bankroll so i suspect this time uh you know first of all it's a bigger prize it's a, a at a much uh, bigger event uh, the the pca being you know basically the largest event like i said outside the world series so i'm sure uh, i'm sure he's he's having a there, there's probably Probably a, a few uh, a few uh, colleagues being yeah. being opened around the the, the Atlantis right now. A uh, day one A of the main event kicked off today. Uh, of course, day I think they have two day uh, ones. So uh, tomorrow I believe will be day two. Uh, sorry, day one B um, to get going in the main event, uh, going throughout the 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 adventure. What's going on? Um, you know, there was some stuff. If you did watch the uh, Super High Roller, there was a live stream. And if you want to check out the live stream, they're, they're streaming a lot of the stuff there. Um, head on over to PokerStars.tv. Uh, but uh, there was a prop bet where Timex, if you watch the, high, the, the live stream oh, yeah. of the high, Super High Roller, Timex got into a, into a prop bet with, uh, with uh, was it Bill Perkins? I think yeah, so. I think there were there were two different ones, and uh, the first one was whether he could do like 300 squats uh, in an hour in, in like a level of play or something like that. And uh, if you if you go over to at where I read it was uh, F5 poker, but they were just grabbing it off of the Poker News um, content. Poker News was the one who, uh, of course, uh, shot the interview with him, and it's it's actually the aforementioned Remco, um, you know, talking about it with with Timex, and he'll and Timex will give you the full full breakdown. Down of how they got to to that number, and then when that was way too easy, uh, they ended up doing 350 push-ups in one level, and he was pretty confident that he could do that, but he failed. I think he got to uh, 327 or oh, something like 323. Wow. Uh, so he was not able to do 350 push-ups in an hour. Um, so uh, this was you know during the level of play. 
Y- yeah, while you're playing a tournament. So it's not just the <laughs> 350 push-ups an hour, but 350 push-ups while you're, uh, while you're playing. So you've got to kind of pump them out <laughs> well, while you're fold, after you fold and all that. It's not like you could do them straight anyways. So, you know. It's, no, it's true. But you might, you might pace them out nicer than you thought. You know, if you get in a, bu- a bunch of hands in a row, that, that kind of eats into your time where you might have, you know, hand them out evenly. But yeah, it's, it's a little bit tougher, but it's, it's obviously not as tough as doing 350. I'm still surprised, though. I thought, I thought Timex was a pretty strong, pretty well-conditioned guy. I, I would have thought he would have knocked out 350 easily. Can you do 350 in an hour? No problem. I'm pretty, I mean, I've never tried, but I'm pretty confident that I could do it. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly willing to do it. I think you should contact uh, Bill Perkins. Minute. I think so. Maybe I'll run into him <laughs> at the World Series this year, or, or the Aussie Millions. We could, he could, he could double up. Yeah, <laughs> no good. That's there right. was a lot of prop betting going on at that that table during the live stream. I was watching it for a bit. They were doing like huge 10k Laden thinks on like how many grains of sand there were on the beach, and <laughs> wow. um, yeah, a lot of prop betting. Dan Coleman obviously just cleaning up. He would just pop in there and uh, and set a line and. Just take all the money. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's 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 all. That's why it's really fun. I think to to live stream get people a hint because that that's really I think the the true fun of of a lot of those super high roller events. It's not you know because I think the the general public is you know tired. Oh, it's a bunch of twenty five year old millionaires playing for a bunch of money again. Yeah. Uh, but but a lot of this a lot of this chit chat a lot of these prop bets a lot of this conversation that's a lot of, of the real fun at it. And when when Adam talked earlier in the show about you know the, the do you miss it? It's it's this kind of buzz I think that that makes the PCA very special because it is full of all the the, the sort of poker culture uh, that that exists uh, you know in our game. I gotta um, say it's pretty dry to watch without the whole cards though. It's hard, yeah, because like it, it so all, many hands don't get shown. No, it, it it's that's that's always going to be a problem with live stream. You have to be a, a pretty big hardcore fan to watch it. I, um, I'm not the other, a, I'm not an MMA guy, but uh, was Tito Ortiz down there? Yeah, so I, I've seen a few mentioned of this. Uh, Poker Stars, it, it looks like Poker Stars has paid for him to be there. You know, they, they've often done this before. They did it. Uh, uh, Matt Sundin, I remember, was there one year. Oh, my uh, favorite was Dave the Hammer Schultz. Was there? Yeah, that <laughs> was the best. Star, stars had the stars paid for Dave the Hammer Schultz. Yeah, there? stars paid for Dave the Hammer Schultz, and I walked wow, up to, uh, I walked up to the because you know I, I can't imagine there's a ton of you know nineteen twenty year old grinders who have a clue who da- who you know the hammer is. So, yeah. but I do. So I walked up. I saw him right away, and he's playing with a bunch of you know kids. And I, I looked at him. I said, "If you guys had any idea who was sitting over there at your table," and I ended up talking to him for a bit. Super nice guy, and he was having a ton of fun. But I mean, yeah, they used to do it with like with David Wells was down there. We interviewed and and yeah, Boris uh, Becker, yeah, and Sergio Garcia. They had uh, there's a yep. ton of ton of guys that have gone. Yeah. Out. So I guess this year, uh, T Ortiz is the guy. For those who don't know, he's a uh, he's a uh, you know ex UFC champion, light heavyweight division, and uh, Ike Axton actually, uh, you know, you. I, the, re- the reason I, I commented on Twitter was because apparently he's leading a workout at the beach on Saturday morning, and anybody can come sign up if nice. they, you email press at pokerstars.com. So obviously they're going to be doing some content around it. But I thought it would be funnier if you kind of got like everybody to sign up if they were all willing to fight Tito at the same time. I think that would be great content. <laughs> and then I taxed in. Hollywood Ike, uh, Hollywood yeah. Ike, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, tweets at me and he says that, uh, you know, apparently at the Super High Roller, there was a discussion of, of how many Ikes would it take to beat Tito. <laughs> oh, it's a and twist on the five-year-olds, right? Yeah, it's a twist on the five-year-olds. I had to think about it because, I mean, like Tito Ortiz, he's about 240 pounds, like I said, former former uh, world champion, you know, just big, strong, powerful dude. Ike Haxton, not so much a big, strong, powerful dude. Uh Good, great, great guy, super intelligent guy, but you know, not necessarily your your number one overall draft pick in the street fight to the death. How many um, Icaxons would it take? Do you think? So I put a lot of thought into this actually, and um, I think you know, I, I think I would definitely bet on six Ikes if they were well coordinated. If the area wasn't wow. too big, it was like a fairly combined space. What do what you think? Wow, over or wow, oh, wow under? Pounding the over. That's. I mean, I can't. You six, don't think I think six Tito crushes six Ikes? I just think if if 
if, if the Ikes are smart, and, and Ike, Ike is a very smart guy, so I assume the other if the other Ikes, Ikes are smart. smart. <laughs> I love the, exactly, all the other Ikes are going to be the as Ikes smart are. As uh, by, by the way, the Ikes are smart. I'll guarantee you that right I now. I know, like like the six <laughs> Ikes combined for an IQ of like a thousand and fifty, yeah. right? Like, yeah. <laughs> they're smart. So so I figured if they all realize they can each grab one limb, then like then that just leaves like the other ones enough to you know because because your entire body <laughs> against one limb is is going to be enough that the other the other two. Ikes can you know start doing damage, but and, they're uh, giant pussies. Like he, as soon as uh, Tito bites them or elbows them in the in the nose and breaks their nose, you got five Ikes. It's done. They <laughs> might be giant pussies. They might be giant pussies. But the thing is that you re- you, you know they're they're smart enough to realize that individually they're definitely fucked. So if any of them backs out of the plan and says no, I'm not grabbing that guy's leg, uh, then then they know that you know they're getting picked off. Their only chance is to to collaborate. So if they're picked off individually, they know. That they're absolutely getting in, getting a beating. So I figured I, I like I like six Ikes. Uh, I, I, I got six. eleven Ikes. You got eleven Ikes. <laughs> God, why can't why can't we do this? Why can't I why can't I give you like eight and a half Ikes and, and we can play this up? <laughs> this needs to happen. There should be something where that happens. Indeed. Uh, all right, uh, moving on to to some uh, more Poker Stars stuff. A uh, pretty big announcement this week. Uh, the uh, rake increases that were announced in October. Uh, we're reversed uh, this week. Happy New Year! Yeah, what? Happy New Year, grinders. Um, all the all the increases that we, there was much discussion about um, in October uh, have been reversed, except for the increases for the spin and goes. I think that was the only one that was saved, uh, or the only rate, rake increase that did stay, <clears throat> which is sort of geared towards casual players to begin with, anyway. So, um, grinders uh, are, are happy today or this week to hear the news that uh, that the the rake schedule has gone back to the way it was before um to be you know far and away the lowest in the industry um now you know i'd like to see them get rid of that foreign currency thing still that they haven't done yeah uh, that that's still there that's really punishing for a lot of people um but uh but that hasn't happened yet um but you know as far as the the de- the decrease the about face it's interesting right i mean this is a, a huge five billion dollar company makes a, a pretty big step and and increases the rake to to the extent that they did um, and faced a lot of uh, backlash from from people on online on two plus two on Twitter etc. Um, and reversed their decision. It's it's uh, it, it, it. You wonder uh, about the process and how that how that happened. Uh, and, well, well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's. It's almost to the point where, where, you know, I saw a lot of people being so cynical about it. They were saying, oh, you know, Poker Stars did this. And it's, it's like when Coke came out with new Coke and it was, it's this elaborate plan to, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, to create, to create bad will and then reverse it and say, look at us, we're the good guys and make people love us more than ever. I think, that's, I think that's an overly cynical point of view. I don't see that happening uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is there, there are probably going to be some number of people who never, who only hear about the original news, right? Who never hear sure. that they're going back because the bad news is always bigger than the than the good news, right? So the story that they increase their rake is always going to be a bigger story that, that they decrease their rake. So uh, that, if they, if that was their plan, that's a, that's an atrocious business marketing plan. But yeah, yeah it, it is surprising. Usually big companies don't just kind of change their mind about things after after two months but um what do you, you know, think happened them- i mean what do you think do you think there was a, a significant drop off in play people leaving cashing out like what do you and you know the backlash online on the forums etc what uh or you know what do you think happened there um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if revenue numbers looked, came in, came in worse than average. It's, it's always hard because the, the only month that we would have to work on is December. December is not traditionally a very good month uh, for online gaming. You know, it's the holidays and, and people don't really play poker the way that they do, you know. So, but even then, you can compare year over year. So, but even then, I, I would kind of think that they would try to collect more data. So, uh, I'm inclined to think it's a little bit more of the, the community backlash and the response. And, and and all of that kind of stuff made it made to me it seems like it's maybe stronger because that's the stuff that doesn't take time to measure. Uh, whereas when you're talking about hard numbers, you you need the data to, to sort of do that. Um, but obviously, it's hard. We it's really hard to speculate what what happened behind closed doors. Yeah. So just like the increase was a business decision, uh, the the de- the decrease or the reversal clearly is a is a business sure. decision as well. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's fantastic that it happened, and it's great that a 
that uh, a company like that is is uh, you know willing to reverse and uh, you know kind of I guess in a under a backhand sorry in a backhand way admit that they made a mistake maybe with raising the rake there um, but yeah it's a business decision so something something happened in those couple of months to make it uh, clear to them that uh, that this was the better way to go and and uh, congratulations to everybody in the community who who made themselves heard uh, you know uh, both uh, like I said on Twitter and and uh, two plus two especially um, you know in in a respectful way you, you hope that everybody uh, gets their point across, and for the most part, I think it was. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's great news. Uh, uh, it's great for grinders, for players, for sure. And uh, and you know what happens here from now on, we don't know. But uh, it seems like it's a it's uh, a, an a admission that this keeping the rake low and keeping players uh, grinding and happy is the way to go for them. Yeah, and it's it's good for everybody, and it, and it maximizes revenue. Because at, at, at the end of the day, that is that is what Stars wants. It wants to maximize uh, the revenues, and uh, it, its best way to do that over the years is to to run the games. Now, and what they did. Say, else, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. I was saying, if nothing else, it's 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 uh, it's going to make uh, Steve happier about coming on our uh, on our show. <laughs> yeah, this week. she will be on shortly, and we'll talk to him about it. Um, they did mention that they were going to. Uh, re- take a look at uh, some of the countries that have their own client um, that uh, are facing taxation, that PokerStars faces higher taxation in some countries, um, and they are going to have a look at reducing VPP multipliers and increasing rake. Um, we'll, we'll ask Steve more about that uh, when he comes on the show. But uh, it almost seems, Terrence, like um, it's more, they thought, well, let's think this through. Maybe we'll make this more of a user pays type situation than Everybody that plays on Poker Stars pays. So if you're living in a country where um, you're, you have high taxation, I'm sorry, but uh, you're going to have to pay the brunt of, of the cost that Poker Stars is, is running into here. Yeah, and, and that's not going to be unique to, to poker or online gaming in general. I mean, look, if you listen, if you live in a country where alcohol is ha- taxed really highly, then you're you're going to be paying a lot more for your bottle of red wine at the liquor store. That's the bottom line. If you live in a, a low alcohol tax country, then then you you get it cheap, and you know tobacco and and you know there's there's cars, all all the kind of things. These costs are always always going to be passed down to the consumer, the government. So uh, at the end of the day, a lot of a lot of uh, you know. You, it, it's important to petition stars and, and, and petition at the the site that you play at, but it's also uh, important to to be able to talk to the people who make these legislative decisions in this country because, you know, you stars obviously is going to keep a very firm pulse on what rake they can charge. They're they're going to charge sure. as much rake as is as is viable uh, to keep the games going, to keep liquidity going, and to keep people at a reasonable uh, a level, you know, of, of success and, and keeping those games going. But governments aren't aware of that because you know they they don't have the experience that Stars has. They don't have the experience of running all these poker sites. They don't understand the the poker ecosystem nearly as well. So you know, at, at the end of the day, if they're going to charge a, a very difficult tax. First of all, Stars has, is going to tell them, "Whoa, you you can't do this because then we're going to have to increase the rake by X amount, and now we're not going to have any viable games." But also, but also the citizens have to do that as well. Uh, so countries are Denmark, uh, the UK, Belgium, Bulgaria all have a separate client. Um, I think you can probably look for a higher rake and and lower VPP multipliers in the future, maybe later in 2015. Um, uh, but it's going to make for, you know, every, a lot of those countries or most of them are, I think, all, I don't know about some of the other, but a lot of them are EU countries. So um, if you're living in the UK, you can go live in um, another EU country that has uh, lower taxation or, or sorry, you can play in a client that has lower taxation on poker stars. Um, so, you know, maybe it, it's going to cause some people to move around Europe. Yeah, I would discuss so, and and people have been moving around Europe for for tax reasons for for a very long time. I wouldn't expect this to be any different. So let's bring in Steve, and uh, and we'll talk about it with him. Steve, welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. Nice to have you back uh, in the uh, friendly confines of uh, of the show. Um, big news this week, and uh, I, I imagine that uh, the, your return coincides with uh, with the announcement this week that PokerStars has reversed 
the rake increases uh, that that were uh, brought in in October uh, on several of the cash games and uh, and spin and go tournaments is, uh, were not uh, reversed, but those were brought in as well. And and it just seems like uh, uh, Poker Stars uh, saw that there was some outrage uh, in the community and and some backlash to to the increases. Um, Steve, can you give us sort of uh, your take on exactly how it all went down? Uh, you know, we're just are always looking and evaluating at, at uh, uh, what's going on with the with the poker economy and the business. And you know, sometimes uh, you get new information. Sometimes you change your mind. Um, you know, the, the the poker economy is 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 an ongoing challenge to manage. There's a couple ways you can look at it. Uh, you know, one is you could say, uh, "Oh, it's a business and it's pricing, and businesses change their pricing from time to time, and uh, that's just part of running a, a profitable enterprise is taking into account of your expenses and your revenues and, and 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 managing them one way or another." And another way of looking at it is, uh, you know, there's there's players who put their money into this poker economy, and and we have a game of skill, and there need to be. Winners taking money out of it uh, because it is a game of skill and people are playing to be those winners. That's the goal for uh, some of the people or you know coming to this game or many of them. Right? It's a it's a game where you play with real money in the hopes of winning. Uh, so so the economy needs to manage so that there such as there's a reasonable number of winners. So uh, it's a challenge to balance the economy in these two different ways, and. Uh, you know, we 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 reevaluated, looked at the information we had, and decided this is the right way to go at this point in time. You know, so it's a interesting. Different, a different decision than made a different decision than a few months ago. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you know because Poker Stars being so huge and having such a giant uh, economy, sort of. Uh, you know, with with the online site, it, it, you know, there's really no other place in the world. To, to draw information from, right? I mean, and it's like you said, it's such a fragile economy. You move one thing here, you add this game, you uh, increase rake here, you decrease it there. And uh, there's waves that go through the entire site and the different games in the economy that maybe are hard to know because you don't really have any sort of information to draw on if you, if you haven't you know been through that before. Yeah, it, there certainly isn't a a poker economy book or a poker economy college <laughs> class you can take. Right. I'll tell you that. And as I mentioned, you know, there's only one of these things that most businesses have to consider when pr- doing pricing. And pricing is an entire, you know, area of expertise and study and and acumen, right? So, uh, and 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 that's just part of it. Would be the old business pricing, but the poker economy is something separate. Finding the two into one, it's uh, it's quite complex. If anybody tells you they've got it solved, I think they've got uh, uh, th- th- their nose will be growing a little bit. So it's a it's 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 a challenge, but uh, we continue to work with it. And uh, the bottom line is, you know, we, our our business is uh, aiming to grow to grow poker. Uh, that's that's our mission. And you know. I, if you overtax the economy, um, that's not really the, the right thing to do to grow poker. Uh, and I'm not saying one thing would be overtaxing, one thing would be under. It's just uh, we want to make sure that we, we have an economy that's, that's ripe to support poker growth. Uh, speaking of taxation, um, you've got a lot of issues in Europe with different countries moving towards uh, applying different levels of tax. Uh, part of the uh, announcement was uh, this quote, VPP multipliers will be reduced uh, within the next few months for players in several additional countries where VAT, VAT and or gaming duty are payable. Uh, these players will be informed directly in the coming days. Uh, Steve, uh, it, it looks like players in uh, countries that have a separate client now uh, for taxation reasons, Denmark, uh, the UK, Belgium and Bulgaria, I believe are four. Um, that are going to be affected. Uh, players in the in those countries are going to be affected, and it's. And I theorized earlier in the show, maybe, and, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it's a move sort of from for poker stars, so that the person that uh, is running into that taxation and is the person who ends up uh, uh, footing that bill because they live in that country. Instead of spreading it across the site to all the players in all the different countries, that taxation increase that stars is running into, um, maybe it's. Going going to be applied a little bit more to the people in those countries. 
You know, actually, uh, I should be clear, for some of those countries, many of them, those VPP multiplier reductions have been in place for quite some time, for years, for, for Denmark and Belgium. So when we went to the, the .dk client, the the Denmark VPP multiplier was reduced. That was uh, it's about two years ago, I think. And Belgium was even longer than that, if I recall correctly, like two and a half or something like that. So those we have a, we've we've long had this uh, policy that when we get taxation and new taxation comes in, whether it be gaming duty or or now VAT is the is the new wild card here. We absorb half and pass half on to the players. It's just kind of the, what we think is a reasonable way to do it. Uh, now, when we went to these segregated markets of Italy, France, and Spain, we reduced via, we re- did some combination of reduced rewards and increased rake. Uh, uh, we passed on half, some through the rewards, some through the rake. And on uh, the, the shared liquidity markets of Denmark and Belgium, uh, and then Bulgaria earlier this year, and, and now the UK. Uh, and Estonia is a is such a country, but the tax is so small it's irrelevant nearly. Um, with here, the share of liquidity, it's kind of awkward or a challenge to charge different rake to two people in the same game. Yeah, <laughs> for for reasons we can discuss. And uh, so we just did the rewards part. So as a result, we weren't actually or haven't been, and still aren't passing on half of the tax to the players in form of rake. It's substantially less than half uh, right now. So, um, yeah, we will develop the ability to, to, to charge that different rake in some way in the, in the future and, and implement the other portion of that half the tax. That's going to be uh, but, quite the challenge, yeah. right? I mean, two guys yeah, in, in, in different countries that are different uh, uh, taxation going to be raked at a different level when you're collecting you know, the oh. same amount from everybody. Let's go into the details of why that's yeah, so difficult. How, how so that, for yeah. ring games right now, we take uh, we take the rake out of the pot every every street, right? So how would you know how much to take out at each street if you um, if you don't know who's going to win the pot? <laughs> right. Because uh, they're from different countries. So you have to take the rake out at the end of the hand, um, which could affect the, the size of the, of the betting and, and pot. Pot, bed pot games, uh, pot limit games, but that's probably not a major deal. Uh, it is a technical thing. And then in tournaments, there's issues with satellites. So if two people have to pay different amounts to enter a satellite, um, to, to, to enter a tournament and you run a satellite, you don't know, and you have a prize pool, you don't know the value of an entry, right? So yeah. if there's a, well, for you, the Sunday Million's 215, and for Terrence, it's 216, you're on a satellite to the Sunday Million, are you giving out one entry for every $215 or one entry for every $216? It gets um, complicated. And there's a few other cases that are even more complicated. So uh, dealing with that is a challenge, but... Uh, you know that's that's what we're here for is to deal with challenges, I suppose. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll we'll figure out a, a way to get it done at some point. Uh, the the notice we put out to people was that something like this could happen as early as July. That's a an earliest case scenario. We just want to make sure we give people plenty of notice, and so it doesn't surprise people when it happened. But we could also go through the end of the year and not implement something like this. It just depends on uh, various how various things go. Uh-huh. Um, what, what I mentioned the taxation earlier, you, you know, the the Denmark and Belgium, there's actually no changes on the VPP multipliers. The UK, because the law, the laws and the taxation, the the gaming duty are just going into effect. I think they call it a point of consumption tax in the UK. Uh, now is when we've implemented the VPP multiplier change here in January. One, then, uh, uh, yeah, for Bulgaria, we did one change earlier this year. Uh, earlier last year in the summer, and then we did a further change uh, just here January 1st. But uh, the other big one is the VAT. There was a European court ruling uh, in the not-too-distant past um, that resulted in uh, a difference in uh, how how um, our services are seen for tax purposes within the EU. And uh, so for certain countries, depends on the laws in different countries, uh, we're now going to have to pay uh, that for for the play on our site. And, and Germany would be one of those countries, a quite notable one, because they're a, a rather large market for us. 
you uh, you must have a uh, a team of tax experts now uh, trying to figure out all this out uh, in the Isle of Man. I imagine uh, that guy's life is uh, is probably uh, pretty busy right now. Interesting is another way to put it. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. That's, uh, got interesting. Full, yeah. So. He's got a full desk at the moment, I can imagine. Um, we've got, uh, so that, anyway, that's great news uh, that, uh, that the, the rake levels are, are being set, uh, put back to the pre-October. Uh, um, and, and I can imagine that, uh, that that's making a lot of people around uh, the office at the Isle of Man pretty happy. Yeah, there are some smiles for sure. Uh, definitely, you know, we, uh, uh, our poker room team is comprised of a, a bunch of current and former poker players, right? So, uh, we want to see the game grow, that's for sure. And want to be making our customers happy, right? So, uh, you know, obviously we can't go around and give a Porsche to everybody at every seat at every table, right? There's <laughs> making people happy, you know, within the, the you know, running a profitable business is also an important thing in order to be able to keep staying in business, to keep making people happy. <laughs> so that also has to happen. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think you know, we we when the milestone hands comes around, you know, uh, we're all rooting for the highest stakes possible, like about the biggest possible prize, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> I haven't, no, I didn't sure. notice. Has the uh, million dollar um, spin and go been been hit yet? It hasn't been hit yet. You know, there's a little discussion in the forums. We don't. We don't issue them in blocks, you know, like scratch-off tickets or something like that. I, there's indication that there's one competitor that might do it that way, which uh, if you read the text on the website, it kind of implies that, which is kind of interesting in my view. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave it to you guys to discuss that. Uh, we do yeah, Adam, we do I feel rant. like, I feel <laughs> like Adam, sorry. Uh, I feel like, Adam, if, even if you hadn't, like, there's, there's no way it would have happened without you hearing about it. Because I think when, <laughs> when it does happen, we're going to yeah. hear about it. Yeah, that's probably yeah. true, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 uh, uh, yeah, no, it, uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's random, right? So there's, uh, it could have gone, uh, it could go a lot of different ways, right? So, but, but certainly your, your math guys w- would know by now, like what was the expected yeah. time of hitting? Like, how much, like, do you, do you have any insight on that at all? I do, but if I told you what the situation mm-hmm. was, it would tell you how many of them have run. Ah. You could reverse engineer it. And that kind of volume information, I actually, um, now that we're a public company, I, I, I can't hint at that stuff at all. Come on, I'm not that good at math, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't, and, and there aren't any listeners either, right? No, no, exactly. <laughs> that are good at math. Yeah. No, they've long, they've long yeah. abandoned this show if they're good at math. That's, that's yeah, for sure. <laughs> or they distrust uh, they distrust parents to do it for them. Right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, thanks for yeah. coming back. Uh, it was great to have you back again. Hopefully, we'll uh, we'll hear from you in the future as well. And uh, and uh, happy to hear about uh, the rate decreases. Yeah, I, uh, me too. Happy New Year, guys. It's a pleasure to be back on the show. That was Steve Day. Uh, welcome. That is nice to have Steve back, uh, for if, yeah. if for just for a week to have that major announcement. But uh, uh, great news coming out of Poker Stars for Grinders this week. Uh, he only comes out for the important stuff, I yeah. guess. Right? He calls it the heavy hitters. Otherwise, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Uh, let's get into uh, a couple of things uh, before we uh, sign off. Uh, some favorite things this week, Terrence. Uh, you had one. Yeah, so I was uh, just kind of, you know, like I mentioned off the top of the show, I've been sick and in bed, and and mostly what I've been doing, you know, when you're sick and in bed is you just read random stuff on the internet. One of the things I came across was The Economist. You're in a little bit of clickbait, hell? I did, I did. (laughs) In fairness, I've been reading a lot of books, but a lot of times, like, when you're you're just not feeling well, your attention span is like 40 seconds long. Um, But uh, I was was clicking on The Economist, uh, the old uh, British magazine, a very nice source of journalism, and they have a story and a guy named Barney Curley, who's an old uh, racehorse trainer. Um, and, and what he basically did, it's a fascinating, it's a lengthy uh, feature read. Um, and uh, he, he basically was a horse trainer and he sandbagged all of his, his horses, you know, made them, made them underperform for a while. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, four separate races. He hit like a, a massive four to one parlay, uh, four horse parlay 
on all these horses that were considered to be really crappy horses because they never they never done well in a race. And you know he he amassed a, an army of guys and he just absolutely crushed the bookmakers. I believe it's in Ireland, and uh, he's done it before. He did it I think the first time was in the seventies. You know, so this parlay paid out <laughs> nine thousand to one. Uh, it's it's one of wow. these cool gambling stories uh, that you just that you just got to read about because you know we we in the poker world we hear about you know we hear about the IV edge sorting stuff. We hear about all these cool angles. So I thought this was an interesting angle from a, a, a form of gambling we don't often hear to talk about this much too much on the show, which is racehorse. Uh, I mean, that's not ethical, but, right? I, it's not unethical because what happens is that um, – Sports bet in, in in horse betting. Uh, what happens is they assign the better horses heavier weights, and so there's this weird thing where um, because they're trying to get like an equal amount of of action and the odds, whereas like one horse will often be so dominant that. Um, they have to actually weigh down the horse. So, like, you know, this horse will be be saddled with 130 pounds, and another one will be saddled with 105 pounds or something like that. So, what happens is that that they don't necessarily run their horses in races that they think they're going to win, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, if you, you, you they interview this guy, and, and he certainly doesn't think it's unethical. But there's a sort of a twist on it. It was that uh, he grew up very poor because his father had a serious gambling problem, and uh, he kind of thinks of this as as, as a revenge. On uh, on his poor childhood, it says you know he got pulled out of school because his father couldn't afford to go to school because his his, uh, his father couldn't afford for him to go to school because he he had a gambling problem and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, fascinating story. It's on the Economist. It's a really lengthy. Uh, you know they can tell uh, it's not your average clickbait because they put some 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 thought into it. But uh, <laughs> if you're interested in gambling and if you're listening to this show, you probably are. Uh, check out the the Barney Curley story on the Economist. Ross, you know? <laughs> that reminds me of that movie Lucky Number Eleven. Have you ever seen that? Oh, yeah. I, did I have, yeah. yeah. Um, my favorite thing, uh, I, I played a ton of PLO the last few days. Um, you played 20,000 hands in a day, right? Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't sleep. My sleep schedule was all messed up. And, and um, yeah, I ended up playing about 20,000 hands in a day. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it, was, crazy. it was pretty absurd. And I figured out my favorite play in PLO is calling raises <laughs> with the nut flush, a naked nut flush blocker, no pair, no draw, just hoping that the flush comes in so that I can barrel it. <laughs> it's a pretty GTO move. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, you run into all kinds of problems <laughs> with that, but uh, <laughs> not the least of which is people don't like to fold at the. People don't like to fold. I don't like losing hands, so I try and figure out a way to win, and I figure out this is a pretty sweet way. It's more fun to bluff your chips off than to get snapped off in some cooler, right? This is true. I think. I think it's funnier too. Also, if at one point you you realize that you don't have enough money behind to actually block the river, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you realize that oh, I yeah. actually just called for sixty percent of my stack. Yeah, the totally. <laughs> I bet a tenth of the pot on the river. He he didn't fold his king high flush. I yeah. can't figure that out. Uh, my favorite thing this week is uh, a trivia league that I'm in that uh, a friend of mine got got me into. Um, you've got to be referred uh, into this thing, but it's it's pretty cool. I, I think back to remember that. Uh, poker tournament, Terrence, by email before online poker happened. I yes, think it's, it's still called happening. WRGPT. Yep. Yeah, and it's it's hilarious. For those that don't know what that is, it was a poker tournament that you played by email, um, and each hand, what it would take like a week to play a hand, right? Because yeah, it, it, takes, email, it takes at least one tournament a year. Yeah, yeah. there's a, there's a, there's at best one tournament a year. So yeah, there's one it, tournament it, it a year. takes forever. It's like like mail by chess. Yeah, you know, <laughs> chess by mail rather. It's a it's that pretty cool. So you, you get a hand and you get the email in the morning and you have to ret- email back saying I fold and then the next guy and it, it takes forever. But um, <laughs> anyways, uh, this is the uh, it's called the Learned League, Learned League. And it's a trivia uh, uh, competition for people by email. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, obviously I'm, uh, you know, not as good as some of the brilliant people that are in there. And I kind of got my ass kicked a little bit, but I had a lot of fun. Um, if you know anybody or, or if you want to go to the website and maybe you can figure out a way to uh, to email them and get involved, it's uh, it's great fun. It's a daily. You get you get a set of questions each day. You play one person each day. It's sort of a uh, type, almost like a fantasy sports type thing where you you and you have a record in your division, etc. Uh, LearnedLeague.com. Cool. So, yeah, you link that up in the uh, in the will. show thread. I will indeed. Uh, right. That is our favorite things for the week. Oh, we got to get the password for the Poker Stars Invitational for PokerCast listeners. Uh, this is a dollar uh, ten buy-in on Sunday. Add it to your grind. It's in the private tab of the tournaments lobby. Um, we've got to come up. 
with a format and a password. Uh, Terrence, so what's your format this week? Seems obvious it has to, with Chicago Joey, it has to be PLO. We, we can uh, six dishonor max. our guest. Six yeah, max sure. PLO, I love it. Uh, we need a password. Uh, how about um, Tim Calm, who, uh, who just banked the... Uh, uh, the hundred or the, the yeah the hundred k super high roller at the PCA that is T I M C A U M uh, all lowercase no capitals all one word that is going to be the password for the poker cast invi- or poker stars invitation for poker cast listeners uh, thanks to everybody who who joined us in the show we had Joe Ingram who joined us from Chicago uh, Alex Dreyfus from Malta to talk about the GPI uh, Steve Day. From uh, from the Isle of Man and Poker Stars Land, and Terrence from Bali. Thanks so much, uh, Ross. On the, uh, the most I made it. I survived. Is a size of a pub. On the ones and twos. Uh, thank to you for listening. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us. The Two Plus Two Poker Cast has been presented to you by the Poker.